年。All right, let's get this uh, impact review going here. This show was, in fact, good. There was some stupid shit, as there always is, but they can't help themselves. I'm sure at points during this review, we will say, keep in mind, everyone, this is a good show. Yeah. We can't help it, but... And actually, the first segment was very much like this. (laughs) Angle and the whole mafia came out. They said Sting was at home licking his wounds. Angle wanted Foley to come out and face the boss. He said he was upset about some decisions Foley had made of late regarding the tag titles or something. And Foley said, leave me alone and just let me wrestle you at Victory Road. And Angle said, you lied to me. And Foley had his fat security guys there, and Angle said, what are these guys going to do? And Foley's like, I don't know, you guys do whatever you're going to do. And Steiner immediately beat them up with a pipe. It was, there was one one very brief thing uh, interruption before Steiner killed them, which was Angle turning his head saying, Scotty, get them. Yeah. And he did. And he killed them with two shots of his pipe. He beat them up more. Kurt pulled him off. Scott said, but I want to hit them more. <laughs> but he relented. It was hysterical. So Angle said, I'm going to give you a choice of which mafia guy is going to kick your ass. And so Foley chose him and punched him. And Jared made the save. Now, this was a classic impact moment. There were five men... Two women and a pipe in the ring, and one dude with a guitar, and they all scattered. Yes. So as soon as they all fled, for absolutely no apparent reason, Jarrett turned and laid out Foley with a guitar shot. Then he left and passed the Mafia on the way out, to which I wondered, well, why doesn't the Mafia go back and kill Foley? Because they only fled because Jarrett came out. And he just beat up Foley. Now, why are you all leaving, Mafia? Go back and fucking kill the guy. Sure. But they didn't. That was just the end. All I know is that somehow in this fracas, when it was all done, both Samoa Joe and Jeff Jarrett were bleeding. Yeah, for absolute, they didn't even get touched. I don't know what happened. Spontaneously began bleeding. I hated this segment. I'll be honest with you. Uh, just too much bullshit. There was a lot to keep track of. A lot of talking, a lot of angles to keep track of, a lot of yeah. shit you're supposed to remember. Just... I don't I don't care enough about the show to think. So stop making me. Yeah. We had a f- literally five second segment of Jared and Foley screaming at each other. <laughs> That's true. I don't even write it down. I don't care. We had a pre taped interview with Tanae and Nash. Tanae was talking about nineteen ninety six. Mike Tanae, first of all, he turns to Kevin Nash and says, You are perhaps the most controversial controversial figure ever in wrestling. Kevin Nash. In a business filled with murderers and rapists and drug users and wife beaters, Kevin Nash is the most controversial figure ever. I coach a gymnastics class, as most of you are well aware, and my kids, I've mentioned this before, they only talk about UFC. They're always talking about UFC. They're never talking about wrestling. These kids don't care about wrestling. Now, if they did care about wrestling, I don't have a single kid in my class that was born before 1996. <laughs> Indeed. Okay? I had a kid today. 1996 happened four years before he was born. This kid would have no idea. This is ancient history to these kids nowadays. So Nash said a bunch of shit. He likes money. We all know the deal. Well, he said that at SummerSlam one year, he compared his paycheck to his friends. Somebody got stiff from their pay, and he decided at that point, and I swear to God I'm not making this quote up, he decided he no longer cared about having good matches. He only cared about making money. Yeah. Okay, then. Even, like, Crumbly. I don't know how old he is, but I think he's, like, I don't know. He's, I, like, 18, isn't he? No, he's older than that. But the point is, he was, like, he was he was in early grade school, I think, in 1996. And this is, like, we're supposed to still care about what happened back then. So then we had the um, Abyss going nuts backstage. Apparently, he's been ranting and raving for seven straight days. Yeah. He's very angry at Dr. Stevie. And why? I, I forgot. Because he got tased. Oh, is that what happened? I assume. I, I, that is, that's right. I totally forgot, and they didn't show a single replay. No, so. they didn't. I don't think they even really mentioned it. But, no. But again, of all the bullshit that happens to Abyss, like, every week, really, for the past seven years. Yeah. Tease ring. Set him off the edge. We got acting with Abyss and Lauren. I love Lauren, but she needs why? to get the hell out of these skits. 
She is just horrendous at acting, and they keep making her act. Just have her look cute and interview people. <laughs> what is wrong with that role? Uh, that's not a uh, that's not a position that exists in TNA. You must either be a cute girl who's a victim of everyone's abuse, or you must be a dorky guy who still somehow comes off as cooler than everyone he interviews. So then he said he uh, he never asked her to stop being a woman, so she needed to stop asking him to stop being a monster. It's profound, quite very, frankly, very, very deep. Then we had the best match I've ever seen. <laughs> Cody Deaner against the Amazing Red. I say this with all honesty. Cody Deaner is currently my favorite wrestler. Everything about him is awesome. He is he has got an awesome look. He plays his character to a T. He wrestles perfectly for his character. I mean, these are all things I'm trying to think of a um Oh, the the uh, the Navy guy who comes out with his nutty haircut. Mm-hmm. You're, Lucky, you're, not much like a sailor. Your gimmick is that you're a Navy guy, and you're cutting your hair like that. This is having not clue one about what a wrestling character is all about. Cody Deaner is so completely his character in every conceivable way. Yes. He dresses correctly. He talks correctly. He cuts his hair correctly. He acts correctly. He wrestles correctly. Everything Cody Deaner does is perfect for the character of Cody Deaner. Perfect. This match was... Hilariously great. Red did all of his stuff. Cody Deaner was a, a comedy goofball. He failed at the end. He missed a huge ass splash after doing the most dramatic setup you've ever seen. <laughs> yes. Red immediately hit him he with a, uh, a tornado DDT that he sold like he'd landed on top of his head, which, because he's a great wrestler, he didn't actually do. And then he was pinned. This was like, this show is two thumbs up because of this match alone. That's fair. This was tremendous, tremendous stuff. Deaner came out with ODB. She has been training him to wrestle. She had him warm up by punching her breasts repeatedly. This caused Mike Tanay to refer to her, to refer to her breasts as, and I'm not making this up, speed bags. You yeah. So then they began to wrestle. Deaner was very confident going in. He had been training. He had been working hard. He thought he was ready to go. Then Amazing Red trapped him with an arm ringer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and Deaner could not escape. He tried two or three things, and then he turned to ODB and screamed, What do I do? <laughs> so he finally got out of it, and then, of course, Red immediately reversed it, and it was awesome. And there was another point where, uh, I forget what happened, but... An arm drag. It was the, it was the arm drag, but... Yeah. There, there was something that happened, but... Diener tried something and it didn't work, and he said, Shit! And then he was hit quickly. <laughs> it was awesome. He missed his big wacky splash. And it was such a perfect story, too, because Red goes up top, but Deaner cuts, cuts him off, and Red takes this awesome bump where it looks like he bounces off the ropes totally out of control. Like, uh, who fell off the ladder and did that? It was Deaner, actually. Yeah. It was Deaner, yes. Deaner took that bump where he bounced off the ropes and almost died, and it was terrifying. Red takes this bump where it's the, kind of the same thing where he's, his body bounces off the ropes, he falls into the ring, except if you watch him, it's totally in control, and, and it was great. So now he's down in the ring, and Deaner decides, I'm going to go to the top rope. <laughs> and he grabs his trucker cap, and he puts it on, and he climbs slowly, and he stands up slowly, and then, even though he has just put his trucker cap on, he reverses it slow- slowly, and he kind of pumps his fist and does the double devil horns and gives a redneck cry, and then he leaps and lands flat on his face, <laughs> and immediately gets up to sell. So I-, I believe after he landed, he managed to wave his hands up and knock his hat off, Setting his hair flying. Awesome. He is just the greatest. And also, this match did not go three minutes. They got time to do something. Yeah. Didn't go a long time. It went six minutes. But many impact matches go two minutes or less. This is like an Iron Man match. And it gets a perfect rating. For what they were trying to do, it could not have been any better. I give this match five stars. I'll be honest. Then we had Abyss going nuts backstage. This is not a five-star segment. Abyss is going nuts, and three security guys show up with baseball bats. And Abyss is like, are you going to do something with those? And the security guy says, yeah, maybe. And as this is occurring, up ran a man. (laughs) An old guy. He was unidentified. His name was never mentioned. He said, Chris, I may be a crazy old man, and you may kick my ass... But this isn't going to happen in my house. Who the fuck is this? <laughs> then we never saw him again. They immediately cut away. I, we never saw this man again. 
Abyss continued to run wild throughout the building, so the man maybe got beat up. I don't know. He was completely impotent, (laughs) probably in more ways than one, given his advanced age. I have no fucking idea what this segment was. I think this was the guy who, like, a month ago, fully hired him to do something. He hired a guy. We had no idea who he was. Foley said he was a big fan. The man disappeared and has been laying dormant ever since. What in the <laughs> hell he was this? he out of his sarcophagus tonight to yell at Abyss and calm him down and then go back into said sarcophagus. Jesus. I don't know. Angle met with Jeff backstage and wanted to team up and rule the business for 10 more years. Yes. Which, in TNA, they will, in fact, be on top for 10 more years in this company, unless Angle goes back to WWE. Jared told him to screw off. He said he brought Angle into TNA to bring TNA to a new level, but Angle had abused his power, screwed the company. Jared said he was the guy in charge, and then signed Angle and Joe against Jared and Styles in the main event with the title on the line. This was maddening, <laughs> but thankfully I don't give a shit about this company, so I really didn't care all that much. Indeed. It was a stupid, stupid thing to do that is far down the list of stupidity as far as things this company has done. So, yes, he, he booked a tag team title match for the world title with about, oh, 70 minutes build. Lauren interviewed the Survivor Chick and wanted to know what she was going to do about the match with Charmel. She said the Survivor Chick was not a wrestler, so how was she going to get out of this? And the chick said, well, I'm not going to. Charmel's not a wrestler either. Hell of a selling point for this match. <laughs> to watch two non-wrestlers. Two compete. chicks who can't wrestle are going to have a match. Indeed. Then Sojo Bolt walked up and buried her for being white and having a fake tan. <laughs> and a flat ass. And a flat ass. And, uh, again, I could never spend more than five minutes with these women, the way they're portrayed on this show. All I know is that we've been asking for seemingly years why the hell Survivor Jenner is on the show. She cuts a much better promo than either Lauren or Sojo Bolt. <laughs> so she justified her presence here. We had Rhino and Eric Young. Rhino's out there with Jesse Neal, the Navy guy, who last I remember, Young uh, or Rhino tossed him into a wall last week. Yeah. Now they're just back together and friends. Well. Well, so they do a match, and Rhino threw the guy into the, like, the guardrail. So the guy got mad and jumped up on the apron, I guess to tell the ref, to tattle. This Navy guy, tattling. Eric Young hit him and threw him in the guardrail. Yeah. yeah. Basically, so, no, the, hold on, hold on. Okay. So Eric Young throws him in the guardrail, yes. and the guy jumps up on the apron to tattle the ref. He does not, however, do this immediately. He does this about three minutes later, right as Rhino's about to get the pin. Mm-hmm. So Rhino gets thwarted, and he gets pinned, and then he's mad at Jesse Neal. <laughs> As you noted, they have never teamed together a single time, and they're already breaking up. Yes. Welcome to TNA. I also just like that it was basically Eric Young beating up two men by himself. When you get right onto it. He had the heat on Rhino. He shot Jesse Neal a dirty look, and he went outside and beat the fuck out of him. Just, just for looking at him funny. Then he went back in and beat up Rhino some more. And Rhino got some fluky offense in, but didn't win. Then Eric Young won. So it was Eric Young kicking two guys' ass. And then the two guys blaming each other and bickering, and they're the baby faces. Charmel found Matt Morgan and said Angle wanted to see him, and Matt marked out. No other way to describe it. He marked out. So they have the meeting, and Kurt basically says, wherever AJ is, there's Chris Daniels. Really? Have I missed a number of episodes? I realize they're friends, but anyway, he told uh, he told Morgan to make sure Daniels didn't interfere later. Tara and Kong against Angelina and Velvet. Kong is, in fact, now a babyface. Heels worked over Tara. I don't know if it was her opponents or what, but Tara looked horrible this evening. She was running weird, taking Mm -hmm. like 100 steps to do moves and 500 steps to hit the ropes and running crooked and all sorts of weird stuff. Shitty arm drags. Shitty arm. Well, that was probably mostly Velvet. But anyway, Kong made the comeback, pinned Velvet with the implant buster, and then Tara took the spider out of the box and put it on Velvet, which caused Velvet, or I'm sorry, Madison and Angelina to run for their lives. Now, when you say run for their lives, they were standing there looking scared for all this, and as soon as the spider was actually visible, they turned their backs and sprinted, sprinted up the ramp to the back. They were running to protect their actual lifespan. They were they feared death was imminent. Yeah. And they stuck around the spider. 
So, yeah, the match was not very good. The angle was wacky. I do just love that apparently the main apparently the main angle is Tara chasing Angelina and trying to win the title, scare her of spiders, yet Awesome Kong got the win. Yeah, and then Angelina did a promo, and, and she was uh, scared. Lauren pretended to put a, a spider on her, and she ran away scared. So, Beer Money comes out to do commentary for the next match. They're the tag team champions. They got their belts on their shoulders. They come out. They sit down. Out comes Team 3D. It's Team 3D versus Scott Steiner and Booker T. In a non-title match to determine Beer Money's challenges for the TNA World Tag Titles at Victory Road. Now, if you heard that, and you are wondering how I screwed this up so badly, well, I didn't. No. Dave Penzer did, in fact, refer to this as a non-title match to determine Beer Money's challengers for the TNA World Tag Team Championship at Victory Road. Well, there was no... It was it was non-title, and that there were no titles on the line here since neither of them had titles. Well, I'm thinking they may have been referring to the IWGP Tag Team titles. In case we thought those titles may be defended here. Well, in, in you know, it would have been nice if Beer Money or if uh, Team 3 actually came out with those belts. That would have helped. That would have helped. So we had this match, and uh, this... Fine, I guess. Bubba well, made a comeback and actually legitimately ran wild. And then Sheik Bashir and Kiyoshi came out and attacked Beer Money. And then in the ring they hit a 3D on Booker. Charmel took the ref. Um, Steiner tried to double close on both guys, got foiled. The UK geeks got involved. Somehow Booker pinned Bubba. It was a very clusterfucky finish. Uh, yeah. I give I give the finish a thumbs down. But I will say that at least in one match. They set up Steiners and Booker against Beer Money and Team 3D versus British Invasion. Sure. So at least from that perspective, they set things up correctly. Yeah, um, but it did have, let's see, Kiyoshi, Bashir, three British dudes, and Charmel. Six people interfered in this tag match. Yeah. And uh, at, like, four different points because, you know, the, the, the Sheik and Kiyoshi came out by themselves. And then the British guys came out one at a time and from different spots around the arena. So it was impossible to keep track of what the hell was going on. Uh, then Charmel popped up in the apron, and then Brutus Magnus finally ran in, he clunked somebody with a, br- with a briefcase, and then he rolled out of the ring, and he realized, shit, I forgot the briefcase, and he jumped into a swatter out of the ring, and it slid across the mat, down to the mat, uh, down to the pretty black mats, and kept sliding under the guardrail and into the fans' feet, and they were like, hey, free briefcase, so I hope he got it back. I was trying to see if I could find, um, hold on. I want to check something here on YouTube. Well, as that segment was ending, there's a quick note, but it's worth noting. Mike Tanay was talking about all the chaos and what it meant for the tag titles and what it meant for beer money and what it meant for Team 3D, and then he says, All right, let's go to AJ Styles. What? No. All right, let's go to commercial. I went to commercial. Yeah. This show is not live, everyone. <laughs> it is, in fact, pre taped They cannot, at any point in the past two to three weeks, they cannot sit Mike Tanay down and record five seconds of commentary where he just says, Let's go to commercial. No, they just kept the gaff in there. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I can... There's one thing I want to see if I can find on uh, on YouTube, and I don't think I'm going to find it, which makes me very sad. And uh, it's the promo that uh, Abyss did. I've become a, a giant fan of Abyss's promos. He was awesome tonight. I know that's that's hard to believe, but basically he did a promo. He, was, uh, he came to the ring... Actually, it was supposed to be uh, Jay Lethal, or I'm sorry, it was supposed to be uh, the yeah. one redneck, and I guess Jay Lethal, yeah. But Abyss beat up Lethal and Creed. It was backstage, and we just cut backstage where he'd, a giant white man dressed all in white was beating up two black men. Creepy. He came out, and he beat up Jethro Holiday. Then he called out Dr. Stevie. Stevie didn't come out, and so Abyss cut this fucking great promo about how he didn't need Stevie anymore, no more ther- uh, therapy sessions, no more calling daily to check in, no more shock treatments, except for you. He said, when I get my hands on you, I'm going to hoist you up, I'm going to drop this 330-pound-plus ass of mine, and I'm going to snap you across my shoulders like a twig. Abyss... His delivery was better than yours. Abyss was so awesome yeah. in this promo, I nearly cried. And then on the big screen was Stevie with uh, Lauren threatening to do unspeakable things to her, but he said he was not a monster, and so he would not do such things. And he said that next week, Abyss was going to show up for therapy, and if he didn't, and then he whispered something, he may have said, I'm going to molest her. I don't actually know what he said, but it was definitely a threat. And uh, this was like the best... (laughs) 
<laughs> as as this is like the the best like uh, pr- little angle. And it was a great segment. Yeah. This was like a gr- Stevie was great. Lauren was horrible, but we'll ignore well, that. Well, she's all she had to do was whimper and cry. It, she's overacts <laughs> horribly. Right. Yeah. But Stevie was awesome. Abyss yes. was fucking awesome. And I can't wait to uh, to see Abyss show up at Stevie's office for therapy next week. <laughs> As long as they talk. <laughs> say, say, say that. It's not absurd. I mean, you say it like that. But it's true. Both guys were very, very awesome here. And if, if you ignore how stupid the Dr. Stevie storyline has been from day one and all the stupid crap they have done for months, and if you just judge this by the delivery of the two men involved, you would think, holy shit, that great big angry guy wants to kick the skinny guy's ass. But he's in a great moral dilemma because now his girlfriend is is uh, being held hostage, and he doesn't know what to do. Does he subject himself to more pain, or does he f- try to try to fight his way free, or fight fight her way free? And it's intriguing. It was it was just great stuff. Abyss is legit the best promo on this show now. He I can't argue. Uh, you liked the one last week way more than I did, but this week for sure was great. Last week was awesome too. He's been awesome for a while now. Angle and Joe against Jerry. I think, to be honest, I may just not have given him a chance because the whole Dr. Stevie storyline has been so awful. Very likely. But, yes, it's Josie probably did what he did tonight. He probably did not wake up this morning and become a great promo. Angle and Joe against Jared and AJ with the title on the line. We had the fancy ring intros and that sort of thing. This was a great TV match. You had Angle and Joe, or I'm sorry, Angle and Jarrett working together first. They're awesome. Then AJ and Joe, and they're awesome. Then they got the heat on AJ and threw him all over the ring, much of which was during the commercial break, but at least they showed us replays. Jared got the tag and ran wild. We had a ref bump that actually made sense because he looked like he'd actually been bumped in the middle of this match. Because there were bodies flying everywhere. And the only thing I hated was Jarrett hits Angle with the stroke off the top, which, by the way, has to be the stupidest move ever. And he goes for the cover, and the ref's down. So uh, Jarrett then goes to get his guitar. (laughs) Do not ask for any logic why he would do this. He had the man beaten with his move off the top rope. What do you need the damn guitar for? Goes to get it. Of course, the ref wakes up and starts confiscating it. Gives Angle a chance to put him in the ankle lock. Jarrett fights and fights and fights, is crawling for the tag. Joe pulls Angle off the apron. Jeff gets to his feet, tries an enzigiri. Uh, Angle ducks, puts him back in the ankle lock, scissors a leg. This traditionally, all throughout history, has been an immediate submission. If you recall the, the fantastic Royal Rumble match with Angle and Benoit, as soon as Angle scissored that leg, it was over. Immediate tap. It's an immediate tap for nearly everybody. Not Jeff Jarrett. Oh. No. (laughs) Jeff Jarrett laid in that fucking hold for like a minute and a half, refuses to quit, and finally passes out from pain. Yeah. You can't tap out for the guy and get his move over. He's the king of the mountain now. Come on. Get his fucking move over. So maybe when you two actually have a match and he puts you in the ankle lock, people will believe it's going to be a finish. Jesus Christ, that pissed me off. Other than that, this match was great. Mm-hmm. So It was great to see. Joe's really good just in general, but it's been far too long since he watched him just bully someone smaller than him. That's when he is at his best. And uh, he was working over AJ here with disdain and, 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 and violence, and it was awesome. So best Joe match in quite some time. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and it built to uh, Jarrett and Kurt, and hopefully, at some point, hopefully Joe versus AJ. I know they're doing AJ and Nash for the next pay-per-view. Oh, God. Not looking forward to that one. So the Eels came out to finish off Jeff afterwards, but AJ cleared the ring. But then Joe jumped back in and beat him up, and uh, everyone else jumped back in, and they were beating the crap out of him, and they cut backstage, and Morgan was destroying Daniels. And suddenly, as the crowd is chanting, we want Sting, the lights do, in fact, go out. Sting appears in the ring, and then just grabs Angle's belt and disappears. (laughs) Yes. That was also stupid. They always have to find some way to make shit stupid. But well, other it's, also, nasty- it's also they always have to find some way to tell the story too quickly. I mean, Sting was just kicked out of the group last week. This should have been a week where the show ended with the, the new main event mafia destroying everyone and running TNA. Why is Sting, Why does Sting care to steal the guy's belt? Well, that's a good question, too. I, guess <laughs> I that, don't get it. That, that's his revenge, I guess. Wow, you stole the guy's championship belt. Whoop-de-doo. We've never seen that a million fucking times. Anyway, thumbs up, Impact. Despite some the of the line has uh, been crossed. Despite some of the criticisms, I remember you said that. That's the curse. Every time that is said on the show, the next week is abysmal. 
So if next week sucks, Vince, I'm blaming this on you. Here's my. And you better pretend to like it. Here's my measuring stick. As long as it's better than ECW, then I, then I will still remain well, on this side of the line. Well, we'll see. I liked ECW. To the back. I didn't watch Impact last week. I didn't miss it at all. <laughs> I didn't miss it so much that I didn't even read your report. I did read the report in the Observer, and I could not make heads or tails of it. I had no idea what Dave was talking about for any of the reports. <laughs> See, I just want to go back and read his then. And I wonder if, if people that don't watch Impact read our reports and can make absolutely no sense of it whatsoever. I it would not surprise me at all. So, going in blind, most likely I will not understand anything that happened on this show. Maybe you can explain <laughs> because, it. Because, as we've noted, if you miss a week of Impact, you're fucked. You've missed a lifetime. Yes. So Foley comes out and cuts a promo about he wants to belt back because he feels naked without it. He's back to being a babyface, everybody, by the way. He said that so goes the TNA title, so goes TNA. Crumbly. Dear Crumbly. Please, please explain this one to me. I've heard this for months and months and months. People explaining that whoever is the TNA champion has power. Why? What does this mean? I seriously, as God is my witness, want some sort of answer as to what power the TNA title is supposed to bring to you. How have we seen that power displayed? Why should I care who has the title? These guys are trying to explain to me that if they have the title, they like have this power over everybody in TNA that I've never seen demonstrated. So, someone please, and Crumbly, I'm going to you because you seem to have an answer for everything TNA-related. Explain to me what this means. So, anyway, Kurt came out and uh, had his belt with him. And Foley told him that he was an emotional guy, both of them, actually. And he said that it hurt his feelings when the Mafia made fun of him and humiliated him the last few weeks. He said they wrapped him up in barbed wire last week, but he de decided they were just playing mind games with him. That's what he said. He actually said, you could have torn me to shreds when I was laying there wrapped in barbed wire. And I thought, wrapping you in barbed wire did not tear you to shreds? Where did they get this shitty barbed wire then? Yeah. But they were playing with his mind. It was, it was sending him a message. What's the message? We don't like you? I guess. <laughs> I, I like the show as a whole, but it got off to a very, very bad start. So... Apparently there was a Montreal screw job angle last week, very original. And then Foley started talking about 1991. I have no idea what this had to do with anything. He mentioned a match with Dory Funk. I had no I I don't know. It's like he cut a promo where he said the last time I tapped was to Dory Funk Jr in 1991, except he edited out the first part of it. So he just started talking about a match with Dory Funk. Yeah. I I, I was bewildered. And I by the way watched last week. He said he had two favors to ask. He said that he knew in order to beat Kurt, he had to be better than he'd ever been. And to be honest, he wasn't sure he could. And he said if he could guarantee one thing, it would be that he would never tap. Then he said, favor number two. Maybe I missed favor number one. I don't know. Again? Maybe favor number one was I'm not going to tap for you. Somehow that's a favor now. Or maybe <laughs> do me a favor and don't put me in a submission hole, but I, let's not actually say that part. Uh, again, this was like the worst edited piece of all time. And they just they, they took a promo, and it, it was like they took a promo, and mixed up all the pieces, took out a third of them, and then just put it back in a random order. So favor number two was he didn't want the Mafia to run in Sunday. Which I figured that's what the rules were for, but apparently not. Why didn't Foley just, just sign a cage match if he didn't want him to run in? Of course, we know the answer, because that won't stop anybody from running in, as we saw in the main event here. But So then Angle does a speech about what the Mafia was all about. He said they were about protecting the way the business used to be. You know, where young guys made no money and worked hurt. <laughs> that's what he said. Yes. And then uh, Sting came out and... And uh, asked Foley if he could challenge Angle one more time. And Angle accepted for Foley and said it would be in a steel cage later. Wow. A lot happened. None of it made sense. None of it was particularly enthralling. <laughs> I, I guess, I take it back, Angle's acceptance of the match and adding the cage tip made sense by the end of the show. But at the time, it was just bewildering 
and uh, numbing. Ah. <sighs> Sorry, everyone. No, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> that is what I think when recapping this show. I'm struggling to stay awake. This is a go-home show, by the way, this everybody. This was a go-home show. Joe was beating up Red for no reason backstage. Don said he must have been provoked. Tanae said that was all bullshit. It was about halfway through the segment where I suddenly remembered that Joe had turned heel at the pay-per-view. Yes. What an amazing heel turn that was. Yeah. I had forgotten all about it. So... Joe beat him all the way to the ring. They had a scheduled match. All the way to all the way around ringside. He finally threw him in the ring, and the ref rang the bell to start the match, and then immediately rang the bell again to throw it out. This show kills me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then TNA security and Mark Davis. I think it was Mike. <laughs> whoever. <laughs> Apparently, this is Bugsy McGraw. Sure. You would never know. And of course, you they know why? Because they're not calling him Bugsy McGraw. <laughs> And he sent Joe to the back. They're calling him Mike and or Mark Davis, and we're supposed to be impressed. Yes. And Joe faced off against three security guards who had fight sticks or batons or something, and he thought about fighting them and then finally backed down. This accomplished nothing for anyone. Serena debuted in an interview segment. Now, if Speaking English with she, nothing to say. He debuted. It's, this could not have been any flatter. She, they could not even have Lauren say... Here she is, making her debut in TNA, Sarita, and have her step into camera. No. They went, I forget if it was uh, either commercial before this or, or Joe and Red and whatever, but the camera was on that, the camera back cut backstage, and there was Lauren standing there with Sarita. Just standing there, hanging out. And she cut a promo, and as you noted, she really had nothing to say. She said, I train the same for all my opponents. She didn't know much about Alyssa Flash. No. And then she said some stuff in Spanish, including the word pollo, which means chicken. Maybe she challenged her to a debate, and it got canceled. We got a Charmel versus Survivor chick video package, which was longer than the Joe segment. This was an astounding segment. Yes, this video package went on and on and on, all building up Survivor Jenna versus Charmel. And then it was over. We moved on to something completely different. A Don West sit-down interview with Survivor Jenna and Charmel. No. Charmel, Josie, Survivor Chick, Raisha, and Kong. Yes. They were all bitchy. By the end of this segment, I would have paid to not see this match on the pay-per-view. If they send me a bill for nine ninety-five, in addition... No, I'll put it this way. If I could get the regular pay per view for twenty nine ninety five, or I could pay thirty nine ninety five to not see this match, I would I would go for the latter. Kong was sitting there. Kong never said anything. She just looked at what was going on with a look of disdain on her face. She's just appalled by this happening. And at the end, all the girls got up and had a, a shouting match and near pull apart, except Kong, who just continued to sit there looking on as if to say. What the fuck am I doing here? Yeah, so it was, she knew that any involvement in this disgrace would reflect poorly on her. So she just blended into the background as best she could. Why Wretched is television. Wretched. I, I describe this as a new low. Borash interviewed Kurt and wanted to know why he was agreeing to a match with Sting tonight in a steel cage. Borash and Don West both play the role of Brian and Vinny, by the way, asking all of these questions about shit that makes no sense. So, Kurt said he was going to prove to everybody who the real icon is, was going to beat him up in a cage, and then once again said, the future of TNA rests on Sunday's pay-per-view, and the Mafia has to win every single title in the company, and then everyone will be calling me boss. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I'm wondering if like the titles are like shares of the company. They we don't know be. about it. <laughs> Which, by the way, that took me zero seconds to think up right there. And he just said, and he would. Uh, Why not do that? Why not get rid of the belts and say that you're fighting over shares in the company, over ownership, and and the the the, the world, the, what used to be the world championship, is now the majority share yeah, in the company. It'd be fifty-one percent shares. If yes. you if you win that, you have fifty-one percent of the ownership, and you can, I guess, either cash in and get the fuck out like someone smart, or defend it in wrestling matches. <laughs> Why not? It makes more sense. It's a it's a it's a, it's metal and leather. It makes what the way fuck more does that have to do with anything than than their normal storyline. I just like that he said. Next week, they'll, next week you'll be calling me boss, and I thought you're already the world champion. 
even if we pretend these belts do grant you power, you're already the world champion. Yeah, why aren't you the boss now? Why are you the boss now? Suicide and Chris Saban, non-title. Hell of a match while it lasted, actually. And uh, Suicide won. Good stuff. And then Shelly hit the ring and sprayed... Um, He's water. Like Muta. He sprayed water in his eyes. And then uh, laid out Saban with a combo springboard leg drop, sending him face first into a chair. So then Homicide made the save with his briefcase, but then saw Suicide down, and the fans chanted, cash it in. He saw the X title just laying there, waiting to be taken. So he uh, made the cover, and of course Suicide kicked out, so somebody's been watching WWE lately. And then a minute later, he hit the Gringo Killer for the pin, and uh, that was the end of that. Yeah, so was he, this was a... Right here before the show turned around, frankly. They, they had a, a as you'd expect... Uh, on TNA with Suicide Chris Saban, a very good short match, four minutes tops, and there was still time for interference and one million moves, but it was it was all good. And uh, then they, then then the machine gun set him up, and I could just repeat everything you said, but we all talked about it. But it, it, it all made sense because the the key was Homicide came down to make the save, and he was just facing the bad guys off, and and then he did a great job of. of Looking at everything, he looked at Suicide's prone form and his own briefcase and the belt lying there and looking back and forth. So you could see the wheels in his head turning. And then he looked at the fans and they all got into it. And then uh, he had a little, the brief little match with Suicide and killed him and won the title and had a great celebration. Party like this belt meant something. Then he went backstage with Lauren, cut a promo about how happy he was to be champion again and tried to hit on her and she said no. And so he basically kidnapped her. I missed that part, actually. Yeah, so he was... He was he was talking he was talking about being champion again. He spoke in Spanish for a bit. And he gave shout outs to some people back in Brooklyn, and he asked her to come get some tequila with him. And she said no, not really. And he said, oh, you don't like Latin boys? And she protested more, so he took her by the hand and led her away. And then she was back two segments later for the abyss thing. Yes. All right. Beautiful people came out. Why Highlight, did they ever? Highlight of the show right here. Angelina Love was in a full beekeeper's outfit, and she still did her same ring entrance. As they were getting on the apron, I was begging for her to do it in that outfit, yes. and they did. Yes. So they, they do, in fact, they have a clue sometimes. It's actually even better than that. This is not just a full beekeeper's outfit. This is a custom beekeeper's outfit with, like, pink bows and zippers all over and hearts glued to the screen on, on the sides of her face. Awesome. And it's even better because her two friends were just in their normal ways. Sure. Flesh everywhere. Yeah. So only she is terrified of this lethal spider. So anyway, she did a promo saying she was going to find Peter to discuss this issue with the mean spider. This is a classic example of TNA ruining a joke. Because the joke was, she meant PETA, she said Peter. Okay, that's not very funny. But she said Peter, then she spelled it out, then she said she didn't know who it was, then Mike Tanae says, she means PETA. It would have been so easy for her to just come out and say... I was all worried about this spider, so I talked to Joe's advisor, and he told me to contact Peter. A Taz joke? (laughs) That? Oh, no. Taz would call it Peter. (laughs) Yes, Brian, I get it. Comedy. No, it's not. Fuck off. You can't tell me that's not funnier than the way they did it. They spelled it out for you. My joke makes people think. My joke, at least two people would have got it and laughed. Name them. Me and Dave. All right. <laughs> I'll accept that. So, anyway. There are a lot of jokes we tell that are just for the two of us. I'm sure that's true. So, she explained that last week's title win, they were not recognizing last week's title win. They, uh, they were only wrestling under extortion when when uh, Tara broke out the poisonous spider. And so the, they were not recognize, recognizing the title win, but at their rematch this Sunday in the pay-per-view, they would make it official, and Angelina would be the women's champion again. So then Tara came out. Yeah. She had the belt around her waist. She was very that proud was of it. That was weird. <laughs> Seeing a champion with a belt around their waist. Yeah. In 2009, that is strange. What's this belt doing here? But she, uh, long story short, she explained that when she saw uh, her friend, her friend Poison, liked to hide in dark places. And when backstage, she had seen Angelina's beekeeper suit laying around. It was a dark place. So I she thought she was talking about her vagina. I think that's what you're supposed to think at first, too. I see. But uh, yes, she uh, um, she said, "I 
let him hide in there. In fact, he's probably napping in there right now. She, so she implied the spider was in the suit. Angelina went crazy, started rolling around, taking bumps, trying to kill the spider that was supposedly in her suit, until finally Tara ran, ran down, kicked her in the gut, hit, hit her with a widow's peak, segment over. This is the best thing in this company by a mile. Miles and miles. It was quite fantastic. And, uh, yeah, uh, this, this, uh, I want to see this match. Yeah. I, I want to see what this a match. Novel concept. Yeah, it's shocking. Serena and Alyssa Flash. Alyssa is cheerleader Melissa, who is, uh, Raisa? Righteous Saeed. Yes, yes. I was just thinking, Alyssa Melissa. That's probably where they came up with it. Cheerleader Alyssa? I don't know. Why could she just be cheer? I guess because she'd be a baby face. They want Alyssa to be a heel. And they also probably want to copyright all names they appear in. Anyway, this was the perfect opponent for Sarita in her debut. Uh, except, well, there was one problem that uh, Melissa ended up looking way better than she did. It was booked. Not This is not the way I would have booked it. Yeah. No, I don't think that was her intention, but that's what happened. Melissa just worked her over for a long time. I figured we'd at least get a bunch of high flying there at the finish. But, no, Flash just, uh, I guess, got rolled up for the pin. Yes. I don't, and a, then a, a later out. Roll. Yes. Then later out afterwards with a, a, Michino, a cross-leg Michinoku driver. So, yes, the, the, the big debut was for Edition for Wars. She came out. She had a couple big moves, but then got cut off and got destroyed. Pulled the win out of her ass and was then humbled. Yeah. To, to, by an unknown foe. <laughs> so, out of all of this, this is how she finally debuted. As a match, again. This match was straight out of Shimmer. Like, uh, seriously, a shimmer match on a TNA show was the weirdest fucking thing you ever seen. It was really good. Yeah. Just and the booking was screwed up. And Earl Hebner was out of his element. And Earl Hebner had apparently... I can't even say he was... He was fucking things up, but it's not like they were complicated spots. He would just, like, count a pin, and the girl would, you know, kick out, and somehow this caused Earl pain. She somehow managed to fall on him. I know uh, Earl is is uh, hated by many people from Montreal, but realistically, Earl Hebner is one of those referees that should probably be in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. He does not fuck up like this, and he just had a horrible night. He was just totally in the way. The <laughs> thousands of matches this man has had. Hundreds of thousands, it seems. Yeah. AJ did an interview about the uh, Legends title match Sunday. Said Nash had ruined a bunch of wrestling companies, and we were better off without you. And said Nash took advantage of the system, and other people suffered because of it. <laughs> Nash has always said, people call this the business, and when I treat it like a business, everyone gets mad at me. And in a way, he's right. And AJ was like, I'd wrestle for free, for the love of the sport. What an idiot. And in fact, in the very next match, Don West cut a promo on him for being such an idiot and saying anybody who loves this shit so much that they do it for free isn't going to be doing this for very long. Indeed. And, of course, if AJ loves it so much, why doesn't he just take all his paychecks and and give it to the young guys? Oh, he doesn't. I realize this is all storyline bullshit, but... Nash, Steiner, Booker against Beer Money and AJ in a six-man elimination tag team contest. I don't know why we had a six-man elimination tag team contest for free on TV. Maybe I missed something last week. No. All right. There was no reason for this. So Nash poked AJ in the eyes and pinned him with the power bomb in one minute. Yeah. I'm not making this oh, up. AJ had tagged in for perhaps 20 seconds. Then we had Booker crotching Storm. It was awesome, too, because AJ just cut this promo, and then he was the last guy to enter for this match. They dropped the lights... And he had this big fancy entrance on stage, the pyro going down like he was the biggest star, and then he got the match and was pinned in 60 seconds. Yeah. Uh, this company. <laughs> Steiner pinned Storm next, I believe. Yes. And then uh, Rude pinned Nash with a low blow. So it was Steiner versus uh, Steiner and Booker versus Rhodes. And Ooh. Steiner and Booker against Rude. Sorry. Rude, yes. Well, maybe. I don't know. He looked like Dusty Rhodes, doesn't he? No. No. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> in any way. It's so hot in here, my brain is fried. So, anyway, as Granny would say, Booker went for the axe kick. Rude hit the fisherman suplex. Charmel took the ref. Steiner Rude then pinned him. And, uh, no, Steiner and somebody. I don't, I give up. <laughs> well, to be fair, there was a lot of bullshit going on this That's match. actually what I was thinking is... Okay, if this were like the six-man main event of a pay-per-view, yeah. and there's like something on the line, I can imagine like all of the outside interference, and Matt Morgan shows up, and Charmel takes the ref, and all this assorted bullshit. This was a match on Impact 
for no reason whatsoever. With nothing on the line. With nothing on the line. Winning the game, nothing and at stake. all this bullshit, so much so that I've just given up. There were the six wrestlers involved. Uh, there were four decisions. There was Sharmel interfering. There was also Sharmel uh, staring down Survivor Jenna, who, of course, was also in their corner. We had one of the other wrestlers coming back with a chair, only to be destroyed by a seventh man. And then afterwards, after all the heels won, then the girls fought again. So, yes, the part where it was just Bobby Roode against Scott Steiner and Booker T was actually pretty good. Yeah. But it was surrounded by so much bullshit. <laughs> like always. <laughs> like always. Just give us some wrestling. It will be good. Team 3D did a promo, hyping up the pay-per-view match with the British Invasion. It was a great promo. It actually was. Both of them. It Team, was two great promos. Team 3D has been great of late. And then the Invasion walked up and, and said they uh, that Foley had added the IWGP titles to the match. So that gives away the finish. So then they got to pull apart, and that was the cue to cut to commercial. And, uh, but, and the best part of all this was Brutus Manus cut his promo, and he was fine. And Doug Williams cut his promo, and he was less fine. And... Then he says, like, what do you think about that, Rob? And the camera pans to Rob Terry, who flexed. Yeah. He flexed his biceps. That's his form of communication, is to flex. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. I'm real big. <laughs> he thinks, I, what do you think about that? I have big arms. Yeah. Abyss did a promo backstage. With Lauren. It was fucking great. Abyss is so great lately. Said he was a 350-pound angry monster. He was going to kick Stevie's ass at the pay-per-view. He had a bag of thumbtacks, and he started pulling them out and poking them into his skin as he talked about the pain and the carnage that he loved. He said he didn't need Stevie or these whites anymore. Write that down, by the way. He'd written a prescription for Stevie. Quote, it's for one major ass beating with no refills. That was the only problem with this promo. It should have been unlimited refills. He said Sunday they were going to have one more therapy session, and he said, don't worry, Stevie, this one's on me. And uh, Abyss rules. This was it's, awesome. There was a point here where, you know, Abyss wears his mask, and he has long hair, and it often covers his face as it hangs down over his forehead. And there was a one point where he brushed the hair out of his face, and he just paused for a second and looked at the camera, and he had a look in his eyes of such pain. And I thought, oh, you poor guy. <laughs> then he began sticking thumbtacks into his own flesh. Yeah. And I thought, okay, you're just crazy. Yeah. Awesome promo. It was pretty, it was effective. And I, I, I actually, I have to admit, I am looking forward to Abyss versus Stevie at the pay-per-view. <laughs> I have this perverse desire to see this because Abyss has been so great. I want to see him deliver a major ass beating with no refills to Dr. Stevie. Anyway, Jared came out to do commentary for the main event, which was Angle and Sting in a cage match. It was your usual pretty good Sting-Angle match. The best part, though, was Don kissing up to Jared and Jared telling him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> almost almost in those exact words. And yes. if, he, if this was on pay-per-view, he may have said, shut the fuck up. Yeah. As it was, he held it, limited himself to, shut up, Don. <laughs> and his delivery was much better than mine. He said Don had been on thin ice for months, and if he wasn't careful, he might step through it, and I was so sad. I do not want Don to step through the thin ice. He must be on the show forever. I do, but only if it's in the literal sense. And now that I want him to die, I just find the idea of Don West thrashing about in nice cold water funny. <laughs> That's horrible. That does sound horrible. Jesus Christ. Can you see him in his, in his matching shirt and tie? Well, you wouldn't see him. He'd be in the ice. Finney. No wonder Lance Storm wants to kill you. Maybe Don West will, too. Your typical match is noted. Joe hit ringside, beat up Jarrett. Then he beat up the uh, now unemployed Rudy Charles, got in the cage, opened the door, locked himself in. Took so long to do so that when he turned around, Sting was all over him. And then Sting immediately put him in the death lock, and uh, as he was doing that, the lights went out. Taz's video played. And then when the lights came back on, Joe had Sting in the choke which uh, led to Jarrett and Mick Foley. Yes, Mick Foley trying to climb the cage and get inside. Didn't work. Epic fail. Epic fucking fail. Nash thwarted them, and uh, that was the end. That's your go-home the show, everybody. The ran out and beat them down. <laughs> yes, there's... Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I just love that Taz's entrance made the save, and lest you think if you missed the show, you know, we're being a little presumptuous here, they put FTW in the number 13 all over this video. Sure. It's Taz. And it, today's like, well, I think I know who that yeah. is, but we'll have and, to wait till Sunday to confirm. In fact, he wasn't even surprised. Yeah. <laughs> he should have said 
it's it's Taz as we've known for months and months. But uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the match was fine, and then there was uh, a lot of drama going going on. A, a lot, lot of, of bullshit. Let's be honest. A lot of bullshit going on. I was I got the general impression of the main event mafia is beating everyone up, and then the show ended, and I thought, you know, I'm I'm interested in a lot of matches for this show. I'm I'm into Angelina and Tara. I'm looking for sure in a weird way to Doctor Bis- Doctor Stevie and Abyss. Uh, the, the 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 tag match could be fun. Which <laughs> one? Uh, Beer Money and Steiner and Booker. Okay, that's all right. In a also in a perverse way, AG and Nash. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> the main event of the show theoretically is Kurt Angle and Mick Foley. Yes. No buys. I mean, you're talking a straight wrestling battle with no interference. And built horribly. <laughs> it's, that I'm actually, a, uh, to be honest, I am perversely interested in that match. They're going to try and have a straight wrestling match on Sunday. Yeah, I cannot even imagine this. <laughs> and it's it's it, that that too. But I, I, my my point is more just they put they put more effort into plugging Charmel versus Survivor Jenna than Kurt Angle versus Mick Foley for the TNA title. Well, basically, yeah. It's an amazingly wretched job of building up their title match on a pay per view. Yeah, it One of sure the worst is. Ever. It sure is. Maybe they're trying to get the brand name out. I don't know. To the back! Vinny and I are going to recap segment by segment. I think the worst pay-per-view in years. This pay-per-view was horrible. Horrible. It's hard to argue with that claim. I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> this was the worst pay-per-view can, of this year for sure. I should do a Chris Jericho promo and start reading out of the thesaurus. Horrible, wretched, vile, appalling, useless, atrocious, insulting, devoid of merit. God, this was horrible. This match, this show did not have a single match above two and a half stars. It had one match that I gave minus five stars. (laughs) That may have been generous. Can't believe the last time I gave a match. I can't even remember the last time I gave a match five and a half stars. Minus (laughs) five stars. The worst match I've ever seen. Jesus, it was for sure the worst women's match I've ever seen. I would have to like look at a whole bunch of, of the worst matches of all time to determine if this was actually the worst match I've ever seen in my whole life. I, 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 I have not seen Sheik and Volkov versus the Bushwhackers in many years, nor Pat Prasco, Pat, Pat, Pat Patterson versus Gerald Briscoe in the, the gown match. There's this, no way that was worse than this. This was for sure worse than the Naturals versus Chris Del Sol and that farmer. There's no way this was worse than Patterson and Briscoe. Because those guys have been around long enough that I don't think that it's possible they could have a minus five star match. Maybe yes. minus three, perhaps even minus four. But there's no way. Minus five stars is like... It is a perfect bad rating. Someone someone asked me, are you sure it wasn't minus four and three quarter? And the answer is no, I'm sure it's minus five. Because to me... Minus five is one of the worst matches I have ever seen. And Sheik and Volkov versus the Bushwhackers, I remember that off the top of my head. That was actually more than minus five stars. But there, I, I will probably never forget this match. I probably will never forget it as I long as I live. I will never recover from this match. I will never be the same again. It was Jenna Maraska, everybody, the Survivor Chick, and Charmel. I've never even seen anything like this. From the get go, in every conceivable way, when I've never. Hermel walked out in her sequined gown with black knee high wrestling boots. Yeah, you knew you were in for something special. Oh my god, this show! And it gets worse. Last month, I at least praised TNA because we've got two pay per view channels now. We've got the regular pay per view and the HD pay per view. And the regular TNA pay per view was thirty dollars, and the HD version was also thirty dollars. And I thought, you know. TNA sucks, but at least I don't have to pay any extra for the HD version. Not this month! Great. This month I paid $40 for this show. $40 I paid for this pay-per-view. Four people bought a month subscription to pay for this pay-per-view. I don't know which four of you that is, but I'm sorry. Give those people their money back. I actually, a couple of pay-per-views ago, called Comcast to see if I could get my money back for a TNA show. <laughs> I do recall that. And they told me no. Maybe if enough people call this time, maybe they'll tell me yes. This was so bad. The badness of this pay-per-view. Tara and Angelina Love, one of the rare highlights of this show, they had a knockouts title match, and it was two stars. An average <laughs> women's wrestling match. 
Crowd was hot early. Yeah. So for those of you that say they need to get out of Orlando, these crowds suck. No! This crowd was really good for this match. We watched this match, for reasons we don't need into here, we ended up watching this match last. Yeah. So we had just watched the whole show going off the air after after Kurt and Foley, and we, we were drained, we were miserable, our friend who was here had left, yep. we did not want to see anymore, and uh, then we watched this match, everything was happy. <laughs> the crowd was hot, they were chanting, they, they, they were... Cheering for the spots, not just like trying to get themselves excited. No, they were into the match and enjoying it for what it was, and it was fun. And then things just went off an immediate cliff. I said, and you disagreed with this, but I said this is the best thing in the show by a large margin. Well, it wasn't. It was a it was an average match. The crowd was at least into it. But if you put the crowd in any other matches, those matches would have all, I guess, maybe been better. But anyway, Tara made a comeback. Velvet tried to spray Tara in the eyes, but sprayed Angelina on accident. And then Angelina immediately kicked out. So they killed the gimmick. I can't call this the best match on the show where they killed the one gimmick they had. Heels got sent to the back. Tara missed a moonsault, and Angelina covered her and got the pin. Tara had her feet on the ropes, but the ref didn't see it. So they interviewed him later, and he said that uh, he was not reversing this decision. The referee's decision was final. Blah, blah, blah. She ended up, uh, Tara gave him a super kick and then put the spider on him afterwards. And uh, the spider, this this two-ounce spider, pinned it down the referee. He, yeah. could, he, could not, he could not escape. It was like a, a 200-pound plate had been put on his chest. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the end of that. This, um, I, cannot, yeah. I cannot say they killed the gimmick because she got sprayed in the eyes. Uh, Tara rolled her up, and then the referee immediately distracted himself with Madison Rain and Velvet Sky for several seconds. So she was pinned for like a 12 count before she finally kicked out. She still kicked out of the spray in the eyes. That's they, they use that for every match as the finish. This would be like if if Randy Orton hit his his kick, and the referee was down for 12 seconds, and the guy kicked out. It would kill it. You're also comparing the kick that has put me out for months to a hairspray spot that just ends matches. Well, sure, but at least it ended matches. Yeah. At least it was something that, that you could use that people believed is, is, is a finish. Now they don't even have that. Now and now, No, it's a finish if the rest pay attention. No, I don't buy it. They, they killed the hairspray I, for no reason. I, I, well, I don't think it matters, but I disagree. Did we need the ref to be distracted in her kick out of this in the first match? <laughs> I realize you watched this at the end of the show after we'd seen everything else. But imagine if this was the first thing you saw all night. That probably would have annoyed me. A women's match for... Well, uh, except that it, at this point, I just expect bullshit in every match from TNA, and I usually get it. So this would have been it. It's, it, it. It comes with the territory. I don't care. It's still still stupid. I'm not giving a, I'm not giving them a pass because they're TNA. This sucked. Then we had Borash interviewing Angle, who flat out said... Tonight, you're not going to get a pay-per-view quality match. Yes. I swear to God. That is a direct quote. In fact, he repeated it. Yeah. He said he was going to beat Foley quickly, and that would be that. And he also said if Joe, Booker, Nash, and Steiner did not walk out of the show with titles tonight, he was going to fire them on the spot. And they just looked at him. Yeah. All right. Matt Morgan and Chris Daniels. Ah, uh, Matt Morgan versus Daniels. Oh, yeah, because that's apparently just his name now. He's just Daniels. I don't know if they thought they had too many Chris's, although I can think that all the others are gone. Chris Park? That may have been it. Matt Morgan and Chris Daniels. Matt Morgan can't even lock up. After all these years, he, he cannot was, do a lock up. He was very bad this evening. He was horrible. Daniels did all he could, but what can you do? So they did a bunch of stuff. Morgan worked over Daniels' leg. Yes, not the little guy going after the big guy's leg. The big guy went after the little guy's leg. I guess to stop him from jumping all all so much. Well, you see, he and got, high flying. It all started when Daniels uh, Daniels just uh, you know jumped over the ropes to land on the floor, and in the process hurt his leg. So the heat spot was the baby face was stupid and hurt himself. Then he did a bunch of cradles on the giant, which didn't work. And finally went for the BME, but the leg gave out, at which point several people in the front row began laughing. Yeah. And then he ate a kick and a elevator for the pin. Depressing. It was depressing. I gave it a star and a half. I don't even know why it was so generous. I, you Take a star off that right now. This is this is a bad match, everyone. It was a bad match. And the, the only thing to add to this is that in between um, Chris Daniels hurting himself and then missing a move to get pinned, 
We saw Matt Morgan just beat him up forever and ever and ever and ever. And it was it actually got, about two minutes, but it felt like two hours. It felt like an eternity. And uh, then he missed an elbow, but he's so bad that in, a, in the process of missing this elbow, he still hit him. Yeah. Bad. Borash interviewed Stevie and Daphne, and Dr. Stevie spoke of Abyss with an analogy related to painting. Not medicine. Painting. Said tonight's match was no DQ. So, every TNA match. It's, he actually said, that's why I had to make this match no DQ. And then he turned to Borash and said, I know what you're thinking. And I was thinking, how do you, Dr. Stevie, have the power to make this match no DQ? But it was never addressed. No. So he just did. And everyone said, okay. Perhaps Stevie's a champion of something. He might be. That's how he has maybe, the power. Maybe he's, he's a champion doctor, and thus he has power to make matches. Daphne told him that she loved him, and he said, I know. So apparently he's working over her mind as well. Dr. Stevie and Abyss. As I look at all the ratings I gave the show, I look back on it, and I realize I gave everything way too good a rating. I gave this two and a quarter stars. I mean, it was it was Abyss beating the shit out of Stevie forever. Stevie bled like crazy. Abyss kept beating on him. Uh, Daphne came down with a taser. Lauren broke it up. And then uh, Abyss hit the black hole slam and used the taser, which caused smoke to rise from the body of Stevie. <laughs> Has anyone in TNA ever actually seen a taser used? Or I think they really used it on Abyss a while back, but that's def- different they story entirely. They don't smoke. Anyway, a fun little segment of violence, I guess. <laughs> was, there was nothing to the match, but, but was, I, Abyss beat him up for a long time and then won. There okay, were many, two and a quarter stars. <laughs> many, many things worse on the show than this. Yes, they did crowd brawling, and then it was Abyss coming in forever. If it was, uh, as the payoff to uh, you know a, a big scary monster finally getting revenge and the little guy's been fucking with him for months and months and months, it was what it, ha- what it should have been, and it was fine. Foley gave a pep talk to AJ and Beer Money. And he explained that if they lost the titles tonight, all of their jobs were in danger on Thursday. Right. Why? <laughs> Power, Brian. I would bet that none of them lose their job on Thursday. I guarantee it. And he also told them to please retain the belt so the main event wouldn't come down to everyone relying on him. Yes, he made sure <laughs> to know that he had no confidence in himself. This is so great. By the way, everyone, this is not a comedy promo. No, this was dead serious. We're, what we're saying is what he said, but he said it in a sincere and uh, and grave manner. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. What a bad show. Team 3D and the British Invasion for the IWGP Tag Team Titles. They said if Team 3D lost, they would not only lose their belts, but also their upcoming New Japan bookings. Yes. <laughs> and, and they noted the big payoff that goes with them. I gave this two stars. It was actually, it wasn't bad until the finish, yeah, it was which was along, the story of this show, in or, fact. In, in many ways. But yes, it was going along perfectly fine. 3D, of course, are a good tag team. Doug Williams is a good wrestler. And Brutus Magnus, when he's surrounded by three other people who, ta- who are that talented, can fit in and, 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 you know, not screw anything up. So everything was going okay. And then 3D got the tables. As Stop here. right there. All right. Team 3D got the tables. Since when are tables allowed in a match? I know I yell about this every single time. But we just had a guy make a match, a no disqualification match, so he could use gizmos. And now these guys are just using tables just for the hell of it. Right. So they bring this table into the ring, and the ref says, you can't use this. Mm -hmm. Does he call for the bell? No. No. He did not count to five. No. He starts taking the table apart himself to get rid of it. Well, first of all, he just started waving his hands in front of Bubba. You can't use this table. And Bubba ignored him because the referees in TNA are completely impotent. And then the British invasion jumped Bubba and started doing spots with him. And, yes, then the ref began to take the table down. So the ref's taking the table apart, and uh, Terry... Rob Terry, I believe, who they just announced as the Big Muscle Man, which actually should be his ring name. The Big Muscle Man. The Big Muscle Man hit the ring, but they just threw him outside. And then they hit the 3D on uh, Williams, and the ref just came over and counted the pin. (laughs) What was the point of the table distraction? Just to do it. Just to do it. It did not play into the end of the match at all. And the best part was... It took you about three seconds to describe what happened. It actually took like 15 to break down. Yes. This ref was playing with his table for an hour. Yes. Just sat over it, couldn't get the legs bent, couldn't get it onto his side, couldn't get it onto his back, and then 
gave up and turned around and counted three. Bashir and Kiyoshi at the ring. They tossed the Japanese guy outside and then put the uh, mad Iraqi through a table. Hell of a running. With the bubble bomb off the top. Probably setting up a match next month, I would guess. Right, sure. And, but you would think that you wouldn't want, you know, 3D to get beat up and so they could get revenge? No. The Sheik ran out, got beat up, and I guess he'll want revenge. This was where we had Slick Johnson doing an interview talking about how he made a mistake and he was going to talk to Mr. Cornette and demand a title rematch be signed for later. Who? Mr. Cornette. He has not been seen, heard from, or anything for months. No. In fact, all we've heard for the past few months is Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett and Mick Foley talking about the power the titles have. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> There's just, everyone in TNA is apparently in charge at the moment. Shouldn't Angelina just be able to squash any attempts at a rematch since she's got the title? Does that mean she has power? I guess. Does that mean the balance of power has shifted? I suppose. We had the match. <laughs> that match. Charmel with Sojourner Bolt against the Survivor Chick and Awesome Kong. Survivor Chick came out and all it read on the screen was Jenna. No last name. Not even Survivor Jenna. No, just Jenna. So she had this completely ridiculous song called I Will Survive. She then proceeded to do a cross between the beautiful people's entrance and Melina's entrance. The lewdest entrance I've ever seen. Basically, and I'm not trying, to, I'm just describing what I saw. It was an entrance designed to show off her asshole. Not just the ass, but her actual tunnel. <laughs> And as she did this, they cut to the other girls who were appalled. Just appalled. It looked for all the world that Jenna had gone on Survivor and earned her, earned her money, and her goal was now to channel this success into a career in hardcore pornography. I have a bone to pick with The Observer. Actually, The Observer's from 1992. And it's not even Dave. It's the people that sent house show reports to Dave. If you read through the old Observers on this website, you'll see a bunch of house show matches, and there will be a match that say Bushwhacker Luke against Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And whoever saw the match gave it minus five stars. I've been seeing this for a while. It always pisses me off. Because it's like, I guarantee that fucking match was not minus five stars. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was the worst match on the show. I'm sure if you were watching a lot of Japanese pro wrestling in the early 90s, or even some, some of the best stuff in WCW, or even the best stuff in WWE... I'm sure that was the worst match you saw, but it was not fucking minus five stars. And these assholes that sent in these matches claiming they were minus five stars, they had no idea what they were in for in 2009. That is clear. Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Bushwhacker Luke. You're going to pay to watch Luke and Duggan do some of this match? That would have been one of the best matches on this fucking show. Yes. I guarantee it. Yes. So they had this match. I hope for their sake those people died before 2009 came along. They didn't have to witness this. Jenna... She got worse the longer the match went on. She got completely blown up. She could do absolutely nothing. She had the worst offense I've ever seen in my entire life. That's People were booing. They tried the catfight spot where they roll over the ref, and nobody cared at all. The only fucking thing missing from this was the Fire Russo chant. I have no idea how we didn't get that chant during this match. I think I heard one guy say it one time, and when his friends did not join in, he immediately gave up. So Survivor Chick ended up ripping out some of Charmel's extensions. So, then Sojo hit the ring, and she got tossed outside. Kong was supposed to catch her, but missed and did not care at all. I mean, not at all. So then, Charmel demanded Kong give her the extensions, which Jenna had given Kong. Kong gave her a karate chop to the neck. Jenna proceeded to do a lap dance on her face and pin her with her vagina. This was the worst women's match I've ever seen. <laughs> In my whole entire life. I still maintain it was the worst match I ever saw. Jenna, who had been earlier been tripped by Sojo Bolt and had fallen to the earth unmoving. Yeah. Like she'd been shot in the head with a large gun. Yes. And after this, and the match continued, she made her comeback with, yes, the worst offense I've ever seen. Worst punches ever. And just stopped selling completely. Yeah. And then by the time this match was done, okay, I will now do my sexy dance on Charmel's face. I'm going to go watch this match again, actually, just to... I just need to prove to myself that I actually saw it. I'm just going to read my notes verbatim here. They're, they're brief. I don't want you to know every every word is in capital letters. And followed by an exclamation point. Jenna's entrance, Charmel's gear, it's horrible, it's getting worse, Jenna is babyface, worst comeback ever, worst match ever. 
Thumbs down. Minus five stars, everybody. Minus five stars. That was a legitimate, honest-to-God, negative five-star match. I mentioned during the time, I it was so much worse than I expected. And you asked what I was expecting, and that was a fair question. And all I can say is, my imagination was limited. WWE would have found a way to smoke and mirrors this. Or actually, better yet, they wouldn't have ever put this match together. Not TNA. Oh, no. They had Jenna running ropes. They were... <laughs> supposedly... I don't know actually what it was you know, that she really I, I did. I am still more offended by her punches than her rope running. If you want to even call them that. Her, her, her hand strikes. They were the worst I've ever seen. I think I, I was. there were two kids outside your condo here playing basketball. I think if we went out there and said, throw fake punches at your little brother, it would have been a million times better. Of course it would have. Yeah. Without any question whatsoever. I think anyone listening to this could have had a better match. Granny and Brent would have had a better brawl. Yeah. Undoubtedly. Without hurting each other. Nash did an interview talking about his match with AJ, said that uh, those geeks Foley had been talking to had been there for five years and were in the exact same spot. Lovely. Say so he didn't get the job done tonight, he would retire. Yes, a retirement match on pay-per-view where they shot the angle halfway through the pay-per-view. Not just halfway through the pay-per-view, they shot the angle immediately before the match. Yeah. <laughs> Guaranteed he'd win the belt, which is what baby faces do, and he's a heel. So anyway, he won the belt. <laughs> AJ and Nash... Dave said this was the best thing on the show up to this point. I have no idea what match he was watching. I think that was an outright lie. AJ went for his legs. The match was really, really slow. They it bought the spot in the corner going. and yeah. immediately did it again. Yes. AJ was still killing himself for this stupid show. Nash wasn't even breathing hard. And keep in mind, this is not a guy that can even do any cardio whatsoever. He can't even run. So AJ did a Garvin Stomp. I think Nash fell asleep. <laughs> AJ put him in a fake submission. I don't know what it was supposed to be. <laughs> then a face lock. And uh, Nash, by the way, for those of you keeping track, the story of Nash's hair has been a story for decades now. And after all these years, it's starting to thin. And if there was ever anything that Nash did not need to make him look even older, <laughs> this was it. He, oh, this poor guy. So he ate the Pele to a shockingly big reaction, but then kicked out and then pinned him out of nowhere with a choke slam clean. Yes. It is 2009. <laughs> Kevin Nash is pinning AJ Styles for championships on pay-per-view. Clean. Yes. This was a bad match. There was a point. because uh, It's amazing. In matches where you want to have a clean finish, they have bullshit. Uh -huh. And in matches where you, you almost have to have a bullshit finish, they do it clean. This, th I, it's amazing. I believe that was the only clean finish on the show. Jesus. I, I believe it was, but... There was a point where, you know, Nash had the comeback, he, or excuse me, Nash had the heat, he was doing his offense, it was plodding, it was slow, but it's Nash. And, you know, then AJ started his comeback, and then he had a couple forearms, and then Nash laid there. Look at my shoulder spasming. Oh, it stopped. Oh. Okay, go on. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, Nash ate a couple forearms, then he just laid there. And so, AJ laid in his back and shouted, is he out? Is he out? And he kept wrestling, and this, this is the point where Nash just laid down and lay on his ass for a while. And I was certain that on one of these forearms, AJ had just clobbered him and knocked him goofy. After the show, I went back and watched, and uh, I don't think so. I think it was a planned, a, a planned, what do you call it, a, a, a work shoot? I don't know. We were supposed to Why are we still talking Nash about Nash actually had been knocked out. He was just laying down for a while. Yeah, it was bad. This was when Lauren went to the dressing room to follow up on the women's title thing, and Slick Johnson came out of the shower he had been boinking Madison Rain or something. And Madison told Lauren to keep her mouth shut about this. Now, I realize some of you are going to say, but Brian, sometimes you pretend that the cameras aren't there. Fine! But in this situation, Lauren was talking to the camera. Yes. So you cannot pretend it was not there, unless you want to pretend it vanished, which it didn't. <laughs> or, or you can pretend Madison Rain is legitimately retarded, and she does not know what a camera is. Maybe there's a camera in disguise. Booker and Scott Steiner against Beer Money. Two and a quarter stars. This actually was on its way to being the best match on the show. Until, of course, the finish. We had uh, Storm spitting beer in Steiner's face, and they hit their finish. But the ref, somehow, was down. I have no fucking idea how. They were saying he had beer in his face. How? He wasn't even close to this spot. I have no idea. So he finally goes to count, and Booker pulls him out of the ring. And then Booker claims that Storm had spat beer in the ref's eyes. So then Booker hit Rude with an axe kick on the ropes, and Steiner cradled him. And the key was that 
The ref and Storm are both sides out of the ring, and they're both having a race. The ref is trying to get in to count the pin, and Storm is trying to get in to count it out. They both start from the same spot, and Earl fucking Hebner wins the race with James Storm. Storm has to pretend he is slower than Earl fucking Hebner. You're, 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 you're actually, it's worse than you're making a sound. Not only did Earl get there first, he got there and counted to three yes. before James Storm could get there. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> it started off, it was just a routine kind of boring tag match, and then as the heat progressed, the, 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 as the... As the, the heat progressed, the heat got louder and louder, and then when he got the hot tag, people were into it, and it was fun for a while. And then the cliff came, and it just turned 90 degrees straight down to the earth and, and dove deep down there. So You only see finishes fucked up like this in TNA. I mean, when's the last time we saw a WWE finish on any show this badly screwed up? And this happens all <laughs> the time. Not that it was... This happened throughout yeah. the show. Uh-huh. These finishes were so badly timed, nobody knows what they're doing, everybody's out of position, and they all just look like idiots. How? Well, their agents suck. Clearly, That's obvious. Clearly. Or just no one's paying attention, either way. Borash interviewed Booker and Steiner, and they did a promo saying they told us so. I guess they told us this would be the worst pay-per-view in years. It was very strange, because they never do a post-match promos, and here, they did. And it was fine, but it didn't lead to anything. They yeah. decided, randomly, we're going to do a post-match promo now. And they did, and then they never did another one. Joe did a promo saying his mentor was here and ready for war, promised to deliver Sting's head to this man. It was amazing on the show to see guys like Joe and AJ still giving 100%. I mean, just how could you care? How could you possibly want to give your all to this pay-per-view? So they had a match. Joe beat him all over the place early. Including into the crowd, none of this was a DQ. They, they did lots and lots of crowd brawling, and after fighting the crowd for several minutes, they went into the ring and proceeded to take turns putting rest holds on each other. Yeah. You know, the best part is, is after the show was over, they had the fucking temerity to air a commercial for Hard Justice, their next pay-per-view. And they announced that all of the matches at Hard Justice are no DQ, or Extreme Rules, or something like that. And I was like, so... You set that up by having a pay-per-view where everybody just did whatever they wanted in all the matches. I try to remember the last time I saw a disqualification in TNA. Never! It's been fucking years. Joe did a big dive. The crowd cheered. He's a heel. <laughs> Slick Johnson was the referee. Clearly nobody in TNA management even watches the pay-per-views. This guy just fucking came out of the shower with one of the girls in the match where he fucked up the finish, and he's just back refereeing like nothing happened. They didn't even make mention of him. Sting stopped selling at one point. I love when Sting stops selling because he's getting punched in the corner and it's time for him to come back, so he just stops selling. And he takes like five punches in a row and then he blocks one and starts to come back. Why the fuck do you bother blocking it? You're not even selling any of them. So he makes his comeback and uh, puts Joe in the death lock and suddenly out comes uh, Taz looking completely square. Taz comes down to the ring I'm trying to think. He looks like a refrigerator or something. Like a, like a, I don't know. So he rolls down to the ring and uh, looking like a piece of luggage. And as soon as Joe sees him, I guess the gimmick is that whenever Joe sees Taz, he goes crazy. Yes. The deal is Joe is the undertaker and Taz is the urn. So Joe's locked in this hold. He can't get out. He's about to tap. He sees Taz. He stops selling, breaks out of the hold, and starts... Ta- or, well, uh, uh, he, he he breaks out of the hold, and then Sting cut him off and started going for cover. That's what I'm getting to, jackass. Right. He powers out of the hold. He stops selling. He starts going nutty with all these punches, and he just gets elbowed and falls down. Yes. Way to go, Joe. Wait. Way to go, Taz. Sting gets a clothesline off the top. Goes for a second one, gets crotched. Then Joe tried the muscle buster, but he couldn't get Sting up. They both kind of fell down, and then he put him in a choke. Got the submission. Again, match completely fucking fell apart at the finish. And then afterwards, Taz got in the ring and looked blocky and no one cared. <laughs> yes, What indeed. more is there to say? I also like how it appeared that Sting locked on the Scorpion and Joe fought and fought and fought. And I, th- I think Sting, I don't know if he thought Taz was going to walk out or if he was ready for music, but Sting has just kind of started to let go of the hold. And he started standing up straight. He never actually technically let go, but for a while it was clear that Joe was in... Not in any pain at all. There's nothing in this position to indicate he should submit. But, darn it, he kept fighting. 
And then Taz came out. So there again is just poor planning, poor communication, people not knowing what was going on. They announced that Lashley had signed, and they had clips of him doing a radio interview where he said he couldn't wait to have a fight with Brock Lesnar. Yes. The, the Lashley announcement was devoted to talking about how great Brock Lesnar is. And how he can't wait to wrestle him, or well, fight him. You better wait. Either way, <laughs> you better keep waiting. And by the way, by the way, they announced Lashley had signed. He's already been on pay-per-view and TV. And several months ago, when I announced that the guy wasn't under contract, and they put the fucking guy on TV without a contract, I had everybody telling me how stupid I was. Oh, Brian, TNA would never be so dumb. You're an idiot. Yeah, well, who's the idiot now? Angle and Foley. Oh, no, first we had the interview with Borash saying, very solemn atmosphere here backstage. No shit? Mm Mm-hmm. So Foley said he was going to create pain and exploit weaknesses. This is actually a fucking great promo, building up this match here. And I thought, boy, you know, if they had put this on the free TV show, of course people not. People might have watched it of and bought not. the show. No, absolutely not. So they had a match, and Angle has a torn groin. Foley's 45 or 42 or 43 or whatever he is, and broken down. They went at half speed. There was a moment where you could see Dixie Carter sitting there watching, and I just thought, what's this woman thinking? I bet she's thinking, what a great pay-per-view I'm witnessing here live. They did some stuff. Foley got backdropped on steel steps. Don was talking about all those powerful belts. (laughs) I'm so sick of hearing about these powerful belts. So then we had uh, uh, Foley doing his big elbow off the thing onto the cement. What an idiot. He, and he, what, the worst part was, he got no... No one cared. No. he. Well, the, the story of this match was two, just two broken old dudes killing themselves for no reaction. Yeah. Happened many times. But the other was worse to me because, remember on Impact when Homicide was about to pin suicide and he looks at suicide, looks at the briefcase, looks at the belt, looks around, looks at all the crowd, and they all started to cheer. Sure. He built up the moment. Yeah. Mick Foley, who's been doing this shit a lot longer than Homicide, threw Kurt out in the apron... Onto the floor, climbed out in the apron, and jumped off with an elbow. Now, keep in mind, the director here is he's got his, his trigger finger on the uh, the button to to cut to different angles. This fucking guy didn't even have time to switch angles by the time Foley was jumping. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I thought that same thing. I was like, you couldn't. I mean, maybe like earlier you tease the spot, and then later you do it, or at least get out there on the apron and think about it a bit. Because Christ, you're old. No, he just threw him outside and didn't elbow off the apron. Wow. So they did some more stuff. Angle finally put him in the ankle lock, and uh, <laughs> Foley got the ropes, and then Angle pulled him back in the middle of the ring. And I was thinking, you know, maybe they could do something somewhat creative, like, you know, Foley puts the claw on himself and passes out. No, he just took the sock off and then tapped. That was the best part. Because apparently if you have a sock on your hand and you tap, it doesn't count. Right. I'll ask Dane about that at the next press conference for UFC. If a guy taps out with a sock on his hand without counting as an official sure. position. Sure. Is, is that allowed? So he did this bullshit, and then uh, that was the end. I gave it two and a half stars. They tried. They did the best they could. But um, then Nash, Joe, Steiner, Booker, and Taz came out and celebrated with Kurt. Today said, this is a worst-case scenario. I'll say... <laughs> it was totally not the best case scenario. Yes, and then the, the main event mafia had a big party. And then when you said they earlier they had the temerity, to, I thought you were going to reference the highlight package for the show, where they went back. Well, and they did that too. They recapped everything you had just paid so much money to watch. Just a terrible, terrible, terrible program. Do so not get do not get the replay unless. For historical purposes, you feel you must see the worst match of all Don't time. Don't even do that, everybody. Just come on now. We we do not need to. We do not need to. Uh, um, what's the word? Uh, encourage this this behavior by TNA. That's true. Do not do not Everyone support pirate this show. <laughs> Jesus, how about just do not support this pay per view? Just, just don't watch it. Just do go better get, things with your life. Go get the replay walk. of UFC 100 for Christ's sake. Call your sake. mother. Yeah. Get a hobby. Get swine flu. Get something. swine flu. I just want to note one more thing here. They were, I, I, we watched that match last, which was at the end of my notes, but as they were building up the women's match and going, you know, recapping the storyline, Mike Tanae said, very matter of factly, that the beautiful people have been undone by, and this is, this is a direct quote, their fear of a pet tarantula. And I believe that's as much emotion as he put into it. Yes. So absurd. 
Thumbs down, everybody. Thumbs down. Giant, raving, angry thumbs down. To the back! All right. Do we really have to talk about this program? People would be very disappointed if we don't. All right. Let's just burn through it and get through as quick as we can. We'll go. Taz came out. Got a promo. He uh, talked about wrestling in ECW. Said he suffered injuries there that shortened his career. Then he said he was doing color commentary for WWE, which got tremendous booze. He said he got tired of doing that. He'd done all he could do. Then he turned on TNA and he saw Samoa Joe. And he said Samoa Joe reminded him of himself as a raw, vicious, violent man. But Joe showed remorse to his opponents. And Taz thought that was no good. He said, you want to be on top in this business, business not be Mr. Popular. So he got a hold of Joe. He said he'd be guiding his career. He thanked Kurt Angle for bringing him on board. And he said Joe was going to win the X title tonight. I actually thought this was a hell of a promo it was by actually, Taz. It was a fine, fine promo. Taz did a great job here, and, and unfortunately it was it was all downhill the, the, from here. But the show Taz, started off actually on a pretty damn high note. Yeah, Taz did the best he could, and I thought he did a good job. So thumbs up for Taz. Sure. And this led to Joe and Homicide, which actually was a... Uh, it started out as a really good match. It, it was really, really good until the finish. Yes. Which was out of nowhere... And I didn't bother rewinding, because I, I, I do not care enough about the show. If I'm confused, I don't care. They did a poor job the first time. They didn't show a replay, so fuck them. Joe just knocked down the ref. Mm-hmm. Maybe the ref did something, I don't know. But Joe just knocked him down. It was clear he put his hands on the referee and pushed him down. It was on an accident. It's not like Homicide ducked and joined the ref. No. Joe turned and struck the ref. Yeah, so the ref goes down. Homicide goes for the gringo cutter. Joe puts him in the choke. The ref wakes up and rings the bell. Don starts screaming about how there's a new champion. The rules are so poorly enforced in the show that Don thought nothing of Joe beating the shit out of a referee. Yes. As it turned out, Joe and Taz were shocked as well. So, anyway, it was a DQ, of course, and not a new champion. So, um, yeah, Joe put him in a hold afterwards. Hernandez made the save. Hernandez and Joe had a stare down, and then Taz told Joe to leave. And uh, aside from the DQ stupidity... Mm-hmm. This was actually some pretty good stuff. It was a very good promo by Taz. A, a short but very fun match with Joe and Homicide. They did some fat-ass lucha, and then it was all Joe working over a smaller man, which is always fun. Then they did a really, really stupid finish. Then Hernandez made his big return, and he and Joe had the great stare down, and Taz was there to pull Joe away. So he had the heel backing down, but at the same time not looking like a sissy. So at this point, this show was actually a win. And then it was all It was never a win again. Hill. So Borash interviews Foley about Sunday, and Foley says Kurt is a new golden boy right now, and he could explain what that meant for the future of the company. Foley isn't the majority shareholder still. <laughs> yes. Did I miss something? I know I missed some weeks here, but where was the week that I, that Foley uh, lost his his shares in the company? Actually, I'm almost positive that somewhere within the two hours we just watched, he was actually referred to as the executive shareholder. How about that? Yes, but he noted that Kurt had been talking to TNA management, and this had him worried. So Angle and the Mafia came out. <sighs> this was where I was ready to throw something at the TV. So. He starts cutting a promo about how everyone in the back was jumping around and jittery since the Mafia had showed up with the belts. Because he said everyone's future is now in our hands. Why? Because they have belts. Well, as Foley had been explaining, Angle had been sucking up to TNA management. Never mind the fact that if Foley owns the company, the management works for him. Yeah. But apparently there's a TNA management out there that can tell everyone, including Foley, what to do. So Kurt's trying to explain that the reason they have power is because they're the mafia, and if they walk out of TNA, everyone left would steer the Titanic into an iceberg. <laughs> this was really the analogy that he used. Yeah. Way to bury everybody. Everyone. <laughs> so, by the way, Survivor Chick and Charmel were still there, by the way, not fighting. <laughs> they're just still in the mafia, like nothing ever happened on Sunday. So... He said Booker, Steiner, and Nash were all going to defend their titles tonight. He mentioned Jeff Jarrett was at home, and he threw out a big smile. That was actually a great moment. Yeah. I laughed hard. Said uh, he wanted to know uh, he wanted to know what Foley really did. He said Foley had lost control and let the inmates run the asylum. Again, I have no idea what he's talking he, about. He's talking about how, again, 
He was talking with management, and they wanted to know what good Foley, what, what Foley really did. What, he, what, what, he, what was he what there for? What does he have to do anything? He, just, he is the owner. He's just the executive shareholder. He doesn't have to do shit if he doesn't want to. So anyway, Foley came out and said last week he vowed not to tap, but Kurt had tapped him at the pay-per-view, which caused the crowd to chant, you tapped out at Mick Foley the babyface. Said he had heard about Kurt working the front office. He said on day one, he said the Mafia was the greatest assemblage of champions in history. Sunday they proved it. Then he said he ran out of gas on Sunday. He ran out of guts in the match with Kurt. He said, uh, as a 13-time world champion, Angle had to know that sometimes we all have a bad day, and Kurt had had 11 of them at least, you know, because he's a 13-time world champion. Maybe he said 12. I don't know. I wrote 11. Anyway, then Angle said Foley had been working the front office for months, telling them the place would crash and burn without him. And I'm sitting here thinking, Vince Russo has all these fucking storylines in his head that we know nothing about. He's writing this show, like, for himself, I guess, and we have to watch it and not have any idea what's going on. So he was claiming he would kick Foley's ass to the curb if he wanted to, even though Foley is the executive shareholder. And then he pulls out some keys. This is Kurt. This is where I got great. He has some keys on a chain, like you'd see at a gas station. Yeah, the, 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 there's keys on a chain and then a big, like... Eight inch piece of plastic that says T and E on it. Yeah, and it look, we both have the same thought. That looks like a key to the bathroom in grade school. Like if the machine gets set to pee, they raise their hands and someone gives them the key. He said these were the keys to Foley's office, and Foley was going to have to fight for them tonight in a pole match. A pole match. Kurt never bothered to say who Foley's opponent was going to be. Tanae had to somehow figure out it was Kurt Angle. This sucked. This was such a miserable, miserable This was failure. such a badly written piece of shit. And leading to Vince Russo's fetish, which is polls. It is such overwritten bullshit. I mean, I just sat there and it's like, I, none of this makes any sense. No. I have no idea what's going on. No. I cannot possibly care. Why is there a, a bathroom key with TNA on it? Why are they fighting over Mick Foley's office? Not to mention the fact that for the rest of the show, Foley was in his office. So what is he fucking fighting over? Don't know. He's got to lock into the end of the day, and now he can't? This was so dumb. Bruce Magnus did a promo to uh, set up a, a match. They immediately cut away. So. It was edited very poorly, and I have no idea what he was talking about. Said Kurt uh, booked a TNA knockout battle royal tonight with the last knockout getting $50,000 and a spot in the Mafia. So now Kurt, because he has a belt, is a booker. How? I don't know. I don't give a fuck. So, and by the way, what a fabulous way to choose a, a new Mafia representative. Uh, I'm, I'm glad they learned something from the NWO black and white, that you just uh, randomly throw people in here that win battle royals, yeah. and we're supposed to take it seriously. Nash and Red. This was the first time I, I really thought, Jesus Christ, I'm watching Nitro during the dark days. <laughs> it was, <laughs> this was exactly what you would expect. Nash powerbombed him once. T's doing it again, and then just shoved him down and pinned him. Don is going, this is the most difficult match ever for Kevin Nash. Outright burying Red. Yes. Then they outright buried him in the match, and uh, and that was that. And and as you noted, it is 2009. 2009, everybody. 2009. I'm going to give a little message to TNA. I don't think this is going to do any good, but I have to say this. Nobody wants to see Kevin Nash wrestle and or win anymore. Well... No one! Lauren interviewed Hernandez, and she actually said, things have really changed ever since you were put out of action. And I thought, was he put out of action in 1995? Because things sure as shit haven't changed in TNA in seven years. So he did a promo, and Homicide walked up, and I think they had a reunion. I think I'm not had, entirely sure what happened. I think they had a fight. They were fighting about something. Because Lord knows what the people really want to see is LAX broken up. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So Borash met with Foley and tried to talk him out of doing the match. And again, Foley's in his office, which is what they're fighting over. <laughs> Some keys to the office he's in. Foley at least apparently knew how stupid this was because he said, and I quote, he buried the quote, stupid pole. Yes. So then his security guys walked in, the fat ones. And they wanted uh, Foley to know that they were there for him tonight, which, by the way, they weren't, just to uh, in, in hindsight. So he told them to take off the M-E-M, which was on their shirts, and then it just cut away. 
They were talking about which kind of tape they should use to cover up the MEM logo. And yes, I cut away. But uh, yes, this is Foley was well aware of what a shitty show he was a part of. And so he just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> he, he, he entertained himself, really. Yeah. He, he just said... It, what does this sound like, by the way? Dying days of WCW, yeah, so everyone. Yes, yeah, so Mick Foley trying to entertain himself. He said Foley, or he said Angle could take his belt, he could take his dignity, he could take his office, but the one thing he could not take was the cartoon of him and Borash. And he wow. clutched it to his chest nearingly, making a joke of the entire show. So Booker and Steiner are watching TV and said they'd found their opponents for later, who ended up being the fat security guards. They interviewed Tracy, who is still with the company, apparently. Lauren wanted to know what she'd been doing lately. I thought she was knockout law, but apparently she's been to uh, Hollywood and has a big project coming out soon. I can only imagine. So she said she went to Foley, who last I checked yes. had no power. Apparently he now has power. And she got permission to be the TNA knockout law for the Women's Battle Royal, which was a match Foley didn't even sign. Yes. That is beautiful. Amazingly. That shows such a complete lack of de- uh, attention to... I can't even say detail. Attention to story. Yeah. They, yeah. The, the guy wrote himself. There were two different people in charge in this segment alone. Booker and Steiner against Rocco and Sally, the fat security guards. They got the heat on the less fat one. Then the more fat one made a comeback and actually had the pin on, I believe, Scott Steiner when uh, Charmel pulled the ref out of the ring. Which, of course, is not a DQ. Why no? Which, once again, brings up the point, if none of this shit is a DQ in TNA, can you believe that they're actually promoting a pay-per-view where there's all no DQ matches? Yes, I can. What in the hell is different from what they do normally? Because they are fucking retarded. They have no That's idea what they're doing. That's why I can believe it. There's no difference. So, Booker then hit a Urinagi, a horrible one on the fat guy. Well, he's fucking 500 pounds. So, why would you book a spot where you do a Urinagi because on Because they're him? fucking retarded. And then the uh, Steiner at the downward spiral for the pin. This was just ridiculous. I will say a small fat guy takes a fine beating. Yeah. Big fat guy. People really got into his comeback. Moves fast. Moves fast for a big guy. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 just the, the, a waste of time otherwise. Eric Young met with Mick, and after a another horrendously overwritten speech, basically got himself added to the... Uh, the ten man tag later, which yeah. begs the question: Why was it five on four before this? They had well, I I I don't know who booked this. Whether they were supposed to think it was Foley, whether they were supposed to think it was Angle, but they put up a big graphic, and I could just see there was it. It said ten man tag, but I didn't know there was a silhouette with a question mark. <laughs> so it was booked as these five heels against you four baby faces, and then you have to go find your own partner. Wow. What a, what a coincidence who, that Eric Young stepped up. I don't know who they booked this or why, but that's how it worked out. Yes, and, and Eric Young in this promo essentially said, I'm going to stab you in the back, probably yeah. tonight. Lauren interviewed Tara about the Battle Royal and wanted to know why she would want to win and represent the Mafia. And Tara, I swear to God, she goes, I don't care about the $50,000. I don't care about the Mafia spots. <laughs> I just want to win. <laughs> Why are you in the Battle Royal? Because she just wants to win, Vince. Just to win things? She wants to be number one. If I challenge her to a staring contest, she'd be unable to turn away until she had defeated me? Apparently. So, the Battle Royal, I could have sworn she they She also, said, by the way, they were talking about Slick Johnson and how he's been uh, on the side of the beautiful people lately. She didn't know his name. She referred to him as Slick Rick, which is a lie. <laughs> I thought they said it was a 10-woman battle royal, but there were 12 people here. Who cares? I don't know if I missed something or if this was just more good comedy. Are you counting Tracy? Maybe even 13. Tracy was referee. In the ring. Yep. We had uh, Awesome Kong, ODB, Daphne, Taylor Wilde, the beautiful people, Sojo Bolt, Tara, uh, Taylor Wilde, Alyssa Flash, and Sarita. And uh, the inside of the ring referee. So, of course, the biggest ratings draw in all of TNA lately... Daphne, she, of course, gets sent out first, of course. And uh, we had some bullshit with Cody Deaner, and it was just fucking sucked. They did a bit to eliminate ODB where she was, hang- she, she was hanging upside down on the ropes, on the outside of the ropes, facing the crowd, and Awesome Kong hit the ropes to knock her down. Now, if you're visualizing the, visualizing the spot in your head, and if I've described it correctly, which I'm not sure I have, but that sent ODB flying off the ropes, down to the floor, upside down. Yeah. Dumb! 
So she managed to not die. Came down to Kong, Sarita, and Tara. And Sarita, all the way from fucking Mexico, in her second week on the show, just gets tossed. Just another girl. So Kong and Tara then fucked up the finish monumentally. So bad, I cannot believe. It was supposed to be like a cradle into a... A crucifix. Or a crucifix into a... Uh, uh, well, they both... Into I don't know what, actually. Uh, I think they were supposed to carry over the ropes and, you know, lean and sort of push her over. But they fucked up this crucifix so badly, I can't believe they didn't just stop, set Tara down, and just do it over again. It is a tape show. It is a tape show. You can repeat stuff. So they were fighting by the ropes, and then Tracy, who is, of course, the referee, tossed them out and won. Yeah. Yeah, the referee won. Didn't see that one coming. Nash was doing commentary and congratulated Tracy with a giant handful of ass. It may still be embedded in his palm as we speak. And then Tara beat up Slick Johnson and put the spider on him. And uh, This was a disaster. Had I not seen that women's match on... Oh, this is much better than that. <laughs> on Sunday. This is yeah. much, much better than that. Probably would have buried this a lot deeper. But it sucked in every single way. So the beautiful people are backstage bitching about Tracy winning. And uh, Angelina Love said the following quote... We should be the ones that are servicing the main event mafia. <laughs> Sluts. Yeah. Outright. So, somehow, well, first she said that they should be 500,000 million times richer, or dollars richer, which I think is a five with 11 zeros after it. I'm not sure. I tried to do this, but I failed. So, anyway, somehow Cody Deaner ended up in this, and they fake started hitting on him. I don't know why. And then Velvet kneed him in the nuts, and then ODB ran in and said, and I quote, I hate those whores. What a segment. <laughs> this is an amazing segment. <laughs> this was Trainwreck TV. Yeah. I could not tear my eyeballs away from the screen for one second. Russo managed to write a segment for Cody Deaner that I hated. Think about that. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea anything. I couldn't explain one bit of this. I, I can explain the part about the, the beautiful people being whores and wanting the money. And why they wanted to service the main event mafia. Yeah. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't just do that tonight. If you go, I, I guarantee you, if Angelina got Love goes to Kevin Nash's door and knocks on it and says, I'm here to service you, he's letting her in. Most likely, yes. Yeah. Lauren interviewed AJ, apparently about a match with Matt Morgan next week. Don't, they, All I know is AJ said this wasn't about Morgan. <laughs> Why does anybody do anything on this show, then? <laughs> I don't know. All I know about this is, I hope I'm wrong about this. But I could have sworn that during the main event of this show, they started to discuss AJ and Morgan. And I am almost positive they said AJ and Morgan were going to have a best of three series, and the winner would be added to the main event. Yeah. I don't know. What? Who? When? And where? I don't fucking <laughs> seriously. No. Every question a reporter can ask, I have. I need to ask about this main event. Who is in the main event? When is it happening? Where is it happening? What are they going to do? Why is it happening? I don't fucking. <laughs> it's a complete no. mystery. And then he said, "All the good guys dropped the ball at the pay per view." That was sure. Everybody dropped the ball at that pay per view. And he said tonight they were going to take back TNA again. Like we're supposed to care. Why would they want it? I don't know. You said, I don't you know, know why any fan would care about these idiots taking back TNA. <laughs> I don't want to see these douchebags in charge of TNA. They are, they lose every match. They drop the ball. They're idiots. Who gives a fuck? British Invasion, Kiyoshi, and Sheik Bashir against Beer Money, Daniels, Eric Young, and AJ Styles. The big faces are so deadly serious about what happened at the pay-per-view, the beer money still drove out their beer mobile to the ring. Yeah. That's one of those little things where it's like, <laughs> drop the fucking beer mobile. I mean, you guys all dropped the ball at the pay-per-view. You're supposed to be all pissed off and ready to take back TNA, and you're driving a comedy tank down to the ring. So anyway, Rob Terry tagged in. That was the highlight of this match. He stood there, and people ran into him, and then he began flexing. Here in... July of 2009. They have found the new warlord. He made Brutus Magnus look like Johnny St. Clair. <laughs> AJ ran wild. He looked... 
he looks literally and exactly like He Man, <laughs> the toy. He looks like a He Man toy and blew it up to six foot four, and and we called him Rob Terry. AJ does his hot tag and all hell breaks loose, and Don West very calmly says, "We got ourselves a Donnie Brook." <laughs> I may have been more excited than he was. So then, of course, Eric turns on AJ, gives him the pile driver. Magnus gets the pin. And Don West actually said, "We all saw that coming." <laughs> <laughs> he was not surprised by this baby or this heel turn. Again, he plays the role of us. Yes. Today then starts going on and on about how there's an unwritten locker room code not to use the pile driver. Again, Russo has all these fucking storylines in his head that we know nothing about that suddenly appear. Out of nowhere in these storylines. Then Foley threw some shit off his desk backstage and screamed, What's next? <laughs> You're supposed to be mad. He did not look mad. He looked like a guy who was frustrated with his job and was... He was doing his best to act badly. And then Eric does a promo, who is, by the way, an evil foreigner. And he said all of the evil foreigners would be now called the World Elite Another faction taking over TNA. Yep. That's what we need. Another faction trying to take over TNA. With Eric Young apparently as their front man. And then Foley tried to attack him, but they held him back. So Foley's attacking him. They're holding him back, and they immediately cut to the ring for Foley and Angle. He comes out like nothing had happened yeah. moments earlier. So they have a pole match for the keys to the office he's been in all night. And I was sitting here waiting for Foley to try to climb the pole. But as it turns out, there's a pole in the corner with the keys on it. So short that you can reach the keys by standing on the middle rope. So I don't know what the point of this pole was. But anyway, they have this match. They did one suplex off the middle rope. That's about it. I, I, yeah. I, These I, guys I, are completely immobile. There was no running. No. And I, I'm, I am pretty sure that was the only bump involved. So, of course, Foley puts him in the claw, goes to climb. The Mafia runs in, and we get a no contest in a pole match for the keys. They couldn't just let Foley get his keys. They couldn't let Foley get his fucking keys and then kill him. No contest in a pole match. That knocked several stars off this show. Just in an instant. Then Kurt tells him, your next card will be your last card. And Don is like, what the fuck does that mean? And then out comes Bobby Lashley. The crowd pops for him. He hugs Kurt. The people boo. Kurt gives Lashley the thumbs up and then the thumbs down, of course, stealing the Triple H Batista deal. And then Lashley, of course, teases hitting Foley, but then turns and beats up Angle. How many of those do we have on this show alone, by the way? And uh, beats up the rest of the mafia. Today, going nuts, he called Lashley, quote, the MMA fighter, the world wrestling champion. <laughs> He's now in TNA. Get excited. Jesus, this was wretched programming. This show sucked. I mean, this was goddamn horrible programming. About a month ago on this show, I declared that I had crossed the line. I am now crossing it back. You crossed the line, Vince. And you I'm... crossed the line, and this is what you got. <laughs> I was a fool. It took a, it took a few <laughs> while for ECW to be better than TNA again, but it happened. It didn't take all that long, quite frankly. And it, I said this in the newsletter. For those of you that don't read the newsletter, I'll tell you right now. ECW with Yoshi Tatsu yeah. and the Abraham Washington show with the comedy out of out of 1991. That show was beating Impact with Mick Foley, Kurt Angle, Sting, Kevin Nash in the ratings every single week. Yeah, I mean without fail every week ECW is beating Impact. Jesus Christ! I would so much Just rather watch down. Tyler Rex and Shelton Benjamin than Impact. To the back. Let's get into Impact. Oh, it started out shitty, though. I do remember this. First off, it opens up with Angle ranting and raving about how nobody does this to the main event mafia. Apparently, he's been doing this for seven days now. And, of course, it did not open with a recap of last week to remind us what he was talking about, so we went in cold. No, in fact, the show opened. This was the 200th episode of Impact, and celebrated in a super long intro video of highlights of the past however many years it's been, featuring a bunch of guys who are not the key focus of the show anymore. Of course, of course. Mafia came out to open the show. Angle was bitching the in agreement with Lashley, and Lashley backed out of it, and he asked him to come out so they could beat his ass. <laughs> in real life. <laughs> okay, you've got seven or eight guys in the ring with weapons. You're mad at a guy, and you ask the guy to come out so we can all beat your ass. Yeah. 
So anyway, Lasher comes out with a baseball bat. Keep in mind, he's they're pushing him as this one guy who's trying to be both a pro wrestler and an MMA fighter at the same time. Right. He's coming out with a bat. Bat foo. So he comes out with his bat. Bat jitsu. And uh, enough out of you. Comes out with his bat, and they get to chit chatting, and he talks about how Angle had made him an offer, but then he he saw Mick Foley fighting so hard, and and decided to go to the good side instead of uh, signing up with the mafia and. Angle talked about how the mafia made up 75% of the TNA payroll. That's nice. He actually said this. Yeah. And he also said that the mafia guys couldn't move very well, but they were smarter than everyone else. Right. (laughs) These are quotes, everyone. I'm not making any of this up. We're not paradising them. We're merely repeating what was said. So then Lashley said he was going to make Kurt an offer he couldn't refuse, and out came Foley. And the offer was, Foley said, how about me and Lashley face Angle and Nash with the world and the Legends titles on the line? And my immediate thought was, what would the Mafia have to gain from this? Well, fully explained, you guys want big ratings. So, if you win, you'll get your big ratings. Amazing. What? (laughs) Amazing. You know what's always amazed me? Why would any normal person watching this show give two fucks what the ratings for Impact are? I, I don't know. They're always talking about ratings like anybody gives a fuck, except the people writing this show. Mm -hmm. Nobody could possibly care. Plus, so the Mafia are going to get big ratings if they win? What happens if they lose? (laughs) Apparently people will only watch if they know the Mafia is going to... Perhaps if they have the spoilers. If they saw the spoilers and saw the Mafia one, then they would watch. Anyway, the Mafia said yes, by the way. Yeah, somehow this argument works. I also like... Angle was talking about how Lashley had double-crossed him, and he said, you don't cross the boss. He calls out Lashley, and Bobby Lashley comes out, and he's sure that says, Bobby Lashley, the boss. <laughs> well, that's funny, actually. So the answer's hyped up this episode, the 200th edition, and Don goes, think of all the twists and turns we've seen in the 200 episodes here on Spike TV. And I thought, there may have been a million of them. <laughs> like, literally a million twists of turns in the last 200 episodes. This <laughs> is quite possible. Hernandez and Samoa Joe. This is actually a fun... This was a mean guy match, is what this was. <laughs> it's true, it's true. A big man battle, and uh, Hernandez threw him around, which was quite impressive. Joe is enormous, and Hernandez like gave him a delayed vertical suplex and all sorts of stuff, and then he gave him a splash off the top and pinned him clean. Mm-hmm. Shocking, this was. It was... And way to go, Taz. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, we were talking about how the, they never do clean finishes, and then the one time you want them to do a screw drop finish, it's clean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great that Hernandez came out. He had new gear. It's the Mexican flag colors. It looked kind of cool. He had a really fun match of two mean guys, two big mean guys throwing each other around. Joe hit a uh, cool suplex at one point on the guy who's almost as big as he is. And then Hernandez won, and it was a, a fun match, and he and Hernandez won clean, so, you know, he actually got momentum out of this, and then he got a promo afterwards, vowing to become the first Latino TNA champ. And that was all great! And then, But it rendered the, like, two months or whatever it's been building up Taz to nothing. Yeah. He's just a guy now. Morgan did a promo backstage, talking about a nothing had been handed to him. Tonight he had the chance to earn his spot in the main event Mafia. Said he'd beat AJ in a best of three series and earn a main event or something. Something he's just ranting and raving, you know. So then AJ did a promo burying Eric Young, saying uh, he never saw this coming, but someday their paths would cross, he'd take him out. And he also said Morgan was a bully, and when he was a kid he beat up all the bullies. Would not not make him a bully? I don't know. So we had Borash interviewing Foley and Lashley. Yes, more talking. Lashley said he'd be negotiating with Angle. Foley convinced him to join. Blah, blah, blah. They said it was the best interest to get the titles off the Mafia. So Why? Then, I don't know. You don't know. Because they, pa- they have power. There's power in these titles. It's everyone's best interest to get a title off them. Morgan and AJ in a match, best of three, the first one, I guess. I guess. I heard in the tapings that like, the first two were short and the third was long, but this was long. And uh, pretty damn good, actually. The hell of a TV match. This, this, I've seen Matt Morgan since like the day he debuted in Developmental, and I think this was the best Matt Morgan match I've ever seen, actually. Which is not saying a whole hell of a lot, but it's, I still think it was. AJ sold a lot, made a good comeback, hit the 450 for the pin off the ropes, and uh, yeah, thumbs up. So AJ's up one in the best of three. Indeed. It was, it was funny because there was a point very early on where AJ 
had some brief offense before he got cut off, and Morgan was doing some really bad selling, which is not surprising. He's not very good, and he rarely sells. But then uh, he recovered by the end, and as long as he had offense, it was pretty good. And then AJ made his comeback, and Morgan was fine feeding him. And, in fact, he took the Pele kick and took a great, wacky, spinning bump for it. So, yes, thumbs up for Matt Morgan. We had Tracy doing an interview with the Blonde backstage, the Blonde chastiser for joining the Mafia. And normally I hate when these women come on and, and bitch and such, but I actually, I don't know why I like this promo so much, but I did. Basically, Tracy said she'd been sitting at home doing jack shit for months and months. She was sick of it. She kept calling TNA. They kept telling her they had nothing for her. And uh, she basically noted that all of the other knockouts sucked, and TNA had no good ideas, which I laughed at, so that was that was amusing, at least to me. And then uh, Taylor walked up, and she was nearly crying about what Tracy had done for her. And Tracy basically said, fuck off. This business is not for ladies. It's for bitches. And uh, <laughs> she stormed off, and I thought, yeah. And Taylor was still near tears. This is a woman with attitude. She actually said, my heart's been broken. Yeah. My favorite line here was, Tracy just buried her. But before that, Tracy couldn't believe she was not on TV. She said, this is not, me being on TV is not HD, it's H double D. <laughs> it's also a good what line. She said was, I should be on TV because I have enormous breasts. Sure. I love this. And then we had another great segment in a totally different way. Don West interviewing Tara about her fond memories of WWE. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you were here to, with a keyboard to transcribe this in great detail. I cannot write fast enough to write down everything amazing and remarkable about this segment. Well, sadly, I couldn't either, but she did talk about these, these, she had great times in WWE, but then it was time to move on, and she'd watched Awesome Kong when she was in WWE. She'd always wanted to work with her, and then Don says, now seriously, let's talk about the beautiful people. And he starts talking about how the... Well, first, she, she called Awesome Kong the best. Yeah. And he said, speaking of best, let's talk about the beautiful people. And then Tara shot the camera a look. Yeah, she just stopped and she stared right into the camera, a, as if to say, what? A golden moment. And so he starts talking about the foot on the ropes at the uh, at the pay-per-view, and she starts talking about sexual favors that Slick Johnson had gotten, and Don cuts her off and says, come on now, let's take the high road. There's children watching this show. And she said she came to prove she still had the it. She was going to prove it on Kong. And then Don said, it's easy to prove stuff when you have, and this is a quote, See, this is what I'm talking about. You were able to write this down or transcribe this. A 17-leg, 15-pound spider. 17 legs and 15 pounds. I realize this is Don West doing comedy, but this was so absurdly over the top. Perhaps they never sold spiders in the Home Shopping Network. This was strangely amusing to me. Thumbs up. I hope they follow this up by getting a 17-legged, 15-pound spider. Then we had ODB and Awesome Kong and Tara against the beautiful people in a six-person. It broke down into a six-way within 30 seconds. Not at the end, when you normally have a, a six-way, no. at the beginning. And then it calmed down into a regular match. So then they showed a very brief clip of the machine guns in the crowd with signs that read, We still work here. Everything was going fine. This is straight out of Nitro. Yeah. Or Thunder. And yeah. the, the worst part was, they weren't even being mobbed. No, they were... <laughs> They were just two geeks in the crowd. The fans were just sitting there, like, next to them. Yeah. They went to commercial, and despite the goofy six-person run-in 30 seconds in, they settled down, and they went to commercial, and everything was fine. And then, by the time they had come back, everything had fallen directly to hell. Yeah, they came back from commercial, and immediately, Awesome Kong and Tara are fighting. Right. <laughs> They're partners. Uh-huh. So they brawl to the back, leaving ODB with all three heels. So she starts running wild. They cut her off. There was a great line where Angelina was choking her on the ropes, and ODB said, and I quote, Get off me, you whore. Don West, of course, freaked out about this horrible language on the children's show. And then uh, Cody Diener jumped up on the apron, argued with Angelina, turned his hat around like he was going to punch her, but instead he kissed her, and then ODB rolled her up for the pin, and ODB was fine with her man kissing another woman, but uh, the women were all appalled, and, and uh, Velvet had a can of, of uh, anti Diener spray or something that she was spraying all over yeah, Angelina. It was labeled Diener Killer. Yeah. So anyway, this was... Uh, it ended up all right uh, with ODB the, the, the Diener stuff. Yes, the, the the we still don't know why Tara and Kong were fighting, nor do we know why the machine guns in the crowd were signs. Actually, well, but, because they're not being used. Because again, 
TNA management has no idea what to do with talented people. That's the story of the show. Yeah, that's the gimmick. Yeah. That's what they want us to think. They want us to think that TNA management does not know what to do with the young guys, but they overpay all of the old guys who can't move. Right. Yes. This is an amazing program. <laughs> and this is a good one, everybody. This is, this is above their average. And it, it, this segment ended with Cody Diener very happy and proud of himself for earning his girl the win and celebrating, and ODB celebrating her man kissing another woman to help her win a match by grabbing her own breasts. Yeah. What? <laughs> it's her gimmick. She grabs her genitalia. All okay? The time. This is known now. Eric Young came out with the rest of the foreigners, anti-American promo, blah, blah, blah. Talked for a long time. He tried to be serious, Eric. Yeah. And the I best are part, serious, Eric. The best part was they had some troops in the front row chanting USA, but they showed a, a shot of them chanting USA, and they're all smiling like they all know this is complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> and I thought, why would you air that on television? But it's TNA. So Eric was talking about how he's no longer going to be a comedy figure. He was going to be the guy he wanted to be. And he proceeds to take a pair of clippers and attempt to shave his head. Did this give you flashbacks? <laughs> Did not until you started talking right now. I was like, hey, wait a minute. This is familiar. The time you lost a shitty, shitty fucking hair match, mm-hmm. and then the clippers would not actually cut your hair off. Which is actually quite appropriate for that match. Yeah. No, nothing in that match should have gone right. Eric starts to try to shave his head, and no hair comes off. So he tries one more time and then just gives up. <laughs> You know what he needed is the the uh, the razor shaped like a matchbox car that uh, the Claudio Castagnoli was plugging on on this last show here. The head blade. That's what he needed here. Instead, he he uh, attempted to use this thing and it failed. So then, of course, this immediately led to a match. It was Team 3D versus British Invasion for the IWGP Tag Team Titles of New Japan in a tables match. How the fuck did they get this cleared? This is like the the uh, tequila bottle deal with uh, with Jushin Liger from That's years back. That's my thought that they did not get it cleared. Oh my god! I think Vince Russo hates wrestling. That it's not enough he has to ruin it in his own company, but whenever he has the opportunity to ruin wrestling in another promotion, he has to jump on it. I don't know. He, he considers wrestling to be his arch enemy. They brawled in the crowd. The bad guys quote freely interfered, according to Don. They hit the what's up spot on Bruce Magnus. Ref took a bump. Yes. Of course. So they had to because of the screw job, you see. Devon put Magnus through a table, but then Eric Young ran in, whacked Devon, and replaced Magnus with him. So the ref woke up and saw Devon in the rubble, called for the bell, and in the impact zone, in a tables match with the British Invasion, there was a screw job in the tables match to lead to the IWGP tag team titles changing hands. This should make people just short circuit. So hateable. <laughs> the whole thing was mind boggling. So yeah, there you go. Brutus Magnus. One, one half, half the IWGP Tag Team Champions. Yeah, one half. <laughs> then we had another great only in TNA moment. They had a deal with all the TNA stars at Comic Con. You had Chris Daniels, Kurt Angle, the Motor City Machine Guns. And, oh, who's that right there? Oh, it's Frankie Kazarian. <laughs> Without the suicide outfit on. Yeah. Just bebopping around. <laughs> How does this happen? And they even showed clips of the tag match that involved suicide. Can you imagine, like, Rey Mysterio at Comic-Con and just clips of him unmasked air on WWE <laughs> television? No. It's no, I cannot imagine ridiculous. that. Ridiculous. So, yeah, way to go, TNA. Then we had a, a Stevie Richards segment where he walked in screaming about how he still had bruises on his body two weeks after their match. I guess he put a $50,000 bounty on Abyss's head. I was not clear on this at all. All I know is he was screaming a lot about Chris, and he screamed $50,000, and Mike Tanay said there was a bounty involved. I don't know. All I know is I go to jujitsu and I come home with bruises all the time. Not one time have I thought, I'm so mad about these bruises but I'm going to put a $50,000 bounty on Thad's head. That's because you're cheap, though. Still, I would not put a $5 bounty on Thad's head because of bruises. Which is really a pity, because it would make the next jiu class fascinating. It wasn't even like he had scars. It no. wasn't even like he had a bandage. No. He had a bruise. <laughs> hey, you know the funny thing about what bruises? What a pussy. They go away. <laughs> Jesus. So we had a video package about Jesse Neal's training. This was so great. They're doing a video package about Jesse Neal's training. And in the middle of it, 
They just stop the tape because Tanae says, we have to go to the back. So they go to the back. It's Scott Steiner and Booker T beating up Lashley and Foley. Now, one guy getting hot again. <laughs> is a 251-pound, rock-solid, maybe early 30s. I don't know how old Lashley is. I think he's like 30, 31 or something like that. Awesome wrestler, MMA star who just beat the shit out of Bob Sapp. And then we have Mick Foley, who's in his mid-40s and can barely move. So who gets knocked out? Bobby Lashley. Oh, yeah. So Lashley's down. They go to commercial. When they come back, ironically, or I guess, I don't know what the even word is, just inexplicably, what, what's the word? Beer money's just there beating people up. Inexplicably is a good one. They were there, There's violence, there's strife, and then they cut away again. <laughs> well, here was the thing. It was beer money beating up Booker T and Steiner. So you think, okay, they saw what I guess is supposed to be a sneak attack, but it looked to me like Booker T and Steiner walked up to Foley and Lashley and just beat them up. <laughs> sure. But we'll pretend that it was a sneak attack. This leads to Foley and Lashley against Angle and Nash. Well, no, you, I'm skipping, you, you, I, this leads to Beer Money trying to get revenge on their fr- for their friends. Yeah, that's what I said. You said you said you start talking about Foley and Lashley. No, Beer Money was attacking them. But was making the save. So they're making the save until Booker T and Scott Steiner turn the tables. <laughs> but it was just a brawl. The point is, it was just a stupid, pointless brawl. And then the lights went out. And we had Foley and Lashley against Angle and Nash with the world and legend title on the line. But since Lashley was dead, Foley had to work the match on his own. I do have to give Foley credit. He was working a pretty fast pace here. Mm -hmm. And he had to do like four matches with Kurt Angle in a three-day period. That's tough for a guy like McFoley. But he did it. And uh, so they brawled. And they got the heat on him and he made a little comeback. And Angle cut him off and put him in the ankle lock, and Foley looked like he was about to tap when the lights went out. Sting appeared in the rafters. The lights went out again, and when they turned back on, Lashley was in the ring with a bandage on his head, but no bruises. And he ran wild, beat up Angle, speared Nash. Foley jumped on Nash, got the pin in the title. Foley's a new Legends champ. And Lashley did not seem to care at all that he speared Nash and and uh, Foley was the one that got the title. So Lashley doesn't give a shit about the belts, which means why the fuck should we? And the answer is we don't, by the way. Uh, it was a rhetorical question. And then Tanae said the Mafia's dominance was waning. <laughs> <laughs> and as I noted, they lost one match. And it's been two weeks. Yeah. It's been ten days since they won all the belts. So their dominance is waning their ten do- days later. Their dominance lasted a week and a half. Yeah. Way to go. And uh, he said it was time for TNA to make his comeback or whatever. And uh, there was your 200th episode, everybody. And at least it was better than last week's show. Without question. That is the best that I can say about that whole thing. So.